The following message is best viewed on an oscilloscope. Morning, everyone. So this is the um, the third session of Accelerator for iChap uh, 220 for physics performance and R&D for future facilities. So today we have uh, a two block of uh, talks. Totally, yeah. The first uh, block will have six speakers, and the second one six speakers. Totally three hours. So each speaker has uh, 20 minutes in total. In fact, uh, 15 minutes uh, uh, presentation plus uh, five minutes uh, uh, question and answer. So the first speaker, we will uh, invite uh, uh, Yukiyoshi-san from KEK. Thank you, Hoji. Uh, so Okay, so let's start highlights from Super KKB. Uh, I would like to talk on the luminosity performance uh, by using uh, nanobeam scheme and cloud wave scheme. Uh, these two schemes are novel uh, techniques to realize extremely uh, high luminosity. So uh, this slide show uh, Super KKB Collider. Uh, Michael Roney has already explained uh, yesterday, but that's I would like to uh, give you a brief explanation of this uh, super KKB collider. The circumference is about uh, three kilometer and the double ring uh, asymmetric energy collider. The number of interaction point is one where the bell two detector is located. And the uh, uh, target luminosity is eight times 10 to 35 with these big currents as a final design. And the uh, next slide shows a uh, final focus system. Uh, this uh, final focus system is very complicated. The horizontal crossing angle is 83 milliradian to uh, realize a uh, nanobeam scheme and the separation of two uh, colliding beams. And uh, uh, the hist uh, this is the history of the vertical beta function at the IP. Uh, we perf performed the one millimeter beta vice uh, for the most of the recent operation. Uh, however, we could squeeze the beta vice down to 800 micron at the end of the spring run this year. And the beta vice star at the super KKB are 800 micron, which is the smallest value in the world. Uh, we move on the uh, obviously a uh, micrometer world. But the uh, uh, final target is 300 micron. So the, we have to uh, squeeze beta function uh, by factor three from now. And uh, uh, if you, uh, you are interested in the beam size, particle beam size, uh, the particle beam size at the IP is now uh, 0.22 micron, which is also the smallest value for the priors. Uh, for instance, uh, we can compare the beam size at SLC, uh, which is about 0.7 micron. Uh, I found uh, uh, very interesting uh, articles, uh, SLC, uh, the title is very uh, cool, the end game, SLC, the end game, uh, which is presented at the EPAC 2000 or 20 years ago. 
And the uh, future crider, CPC and LCC is about uh, one millimeter or two millimeter bed rest. Okay, so uh, this slide shows the definition of the luminosity, uh, specific uh, luminosity and the beam beam parameter used in the slides. In the case of the nano beam scheme, such as a large beam scheme angle, the horizontal beam size can be replaced with a bunch lengths uh, multiplied by the half crossing angle here. Uh, the narrow grass requirement is modified uh, by the real horizontal beam size divided by the uh, half crossing angle. So the, consequently, we can squeeze a beta function at the IP smaller than the bunch lengths. However, uh, I would like to say the bunch lengths affect the luminosity as shown in the formula. So we uh, should take care of the bunch lengthening due to the impedance uh, effects. Uh, this slide shows the cloud west scheme. Uh, we use a pair of sector poles here to move the west along the opposite beam line. We use two sector poles, uh, which are connected by minus i transformation. So we adapt opposite deviation from the reference field to make the cloud west. If you see the interaction point, uh, the inter, uh, inner particles, inner particles uh, in the horizontal direction have the defocusing and the uh, west move far from the original position. On the other hand, uh, the outer particle uh, have to have the focusing effect. Then the west move near from the original point. Uh, this is a crowd west lattice in the area. Uh, HID is similar to LDR. Uh, two pairs of sector poles are uh, shown in this uh, in, in these figures. Uh, these uh, sector poles are uh, adjusted to make the crow west with keeping the uh, chromaticity. Uh, this slide shows the, how the crow west sector pole works for the interaction, uh, interaction point by using a simple tracking simulation. Uh, the left uh, plot shows the phase space at the IP. Uh, this is the horizontal phase space, and this is the vertical phase space. Uh, that, <clears throat> uh, if there is no cloud west, the vertical phase space becomes a gray uh, color. Uh, but uh, when we adapt the cloud west, the vertical phase space becomes a uh, uh, red and blue. Uh, color, which correspond to inner particles and outer particles respectively. The inner particle, uh, red color, indicated by red color, uh, should have positive alpha y and a negative alpha y for the outer uh, particles. So we can see the vertical alpha function at the IP, which indicates the west to move to the opposite beam line correctly. Uh, this is the uh, operation history for one and a half year in phase three. Uh, beam currents, HR beam currents and LDR beam currents and the luminosity. Uh, the total uh, operation time is about nine months. The vertical beta function at the IP has been squeezed from three millimeter down to 0.8 millimeter gradually since the last spring run. The peak luminosity was also improved uh, as squeezing the beta function. Uh, this slide shows the recent operation summary for four months until uh, this summer. The beam currents and the uh, luminosities are uh, shown in the figures. Uh, the maximum beam current is 770 milliamps in LEL and uh, 60, 660 milliamps in the HEL. The peak luminosity of 2.4 times 10 to 34 was achieved, which is higher than the KKB record. The highest uh, integrated luminosity per day was about 1.5, 1.35 in the to band as a recorded luminosity. We also operated the off resonance energy two times. We adopted a uh, Crow West scheme for both LED and HR, which is one of the new items. We adopt a high emittance lattice to reduce uh, uh, two shake effects in area. 
the emittance changes from two nanometer to four nanometer here. On the other hand, we try to correct uh, chromatic X-ray coupling by using a uh, rotatable six poles in the area. The finally, uh, we squeezed a uh, beta function at the IP from one millimeter down to 0.8 millimeter. Uh, this, uh, oh, excuse me. Uh, so I show, uh, table shows uh, how much improved the luminosity, peak luminosity with bell to data taking. The peak luminosity is doubled uh, for the operation by operation, even though the peak uh, beam currents do not increase so much. Okay, this is a specific luminosity for one millimeter optics. Uh, the specific luminosity is much improved from uh, 2019 autumn run uh, shown in the figures. Uh, we can increase the higher punch current product with a uh, uh, cloud west and uh, collimator tuning and Linux improvement. However, we observe, obviously observe uh, beam blow up due to beam beam interaction, because if there's no beam blow up, the synchronicity should be constant. So we are trying to reduce the beam grow up as much as possible to reduce nonlinear effects such as uh, chromatic cell coupling and higher order effects. If uh, we can add the uh, specific luminosity for 0.8 millimeter beta Y star yellow uh, plot, uh, the specific luminosity increase as squeezing the beta vertical beta function at the IP, if you compare the specific luminosity between uh, one millimeter beta Y star and 0.8 millimeter beta Y star. In the case of uh, 0.8 millimeter optics, we operate at about uh, 0.3 milliamp square uh, for physics run. So we can uh, tuning, uh, collision tuning with this uh, region. But uh, we also showed the higher uh, bunch current product larger than 0.4 milliamp square or 0.8 millimeter beta by star. However, uh, the collision tuning is not enough due to lack of operation time. So there's a room to improve the space luminosity at the higher bunch current, uh, more than 0.4 milliamp per square or 0.8 millimeter beta by star. Uh, this uh, is a best of shift, uh, the beam currents and the luminosity, we always, always use the top-up injection to keep the beam current. The recent, uh, the recorded luminosity is about 550 inverse picobam per eight hours, and uh, it is about 90% efficiency. Uh, this plot shows the bunch filling pattern uh, we introduce uh, two about gaps to make about trigger fast as much as possible. The harmonic number is uh, 5,120. However, we use uh, less than 1,000 bunches uh, stored, which are stored in this case. Of course, we can increase the number of bunches to increase total beam current. Uh, this table shows a uh, comparison between the uh, KKB and the Super KKB, recent Super KKB machine parameters and the uh, final uh, design parameters. The peak luminosity at the uh, latest Super KKB operation is uh, larger than KKB records. Although the beam current, if you look at the beam current, uh, the beam current, uh, almost half of those of KKB the latest super kicking machine parameters are still far from the final design. Uh, we have just started the challenge of luminosity frontier. Okay, so the summary, the peak luminosity of 2.4 times 10 to 34, which uh, with a bell to data vision is a world record. Uh, the vertical beta at the IP uh, 0.8 millimeter uh, is the smallest value in the world. Beam size at the IP also smallest. The super KKB applies a really large beam skin angle. 
The crowd waste schemes seem to work successfully, especially it's effective, effective at the higher bunch current. The low data of sector poles have been utilized to collect uh, chromatic coupling in the area. The effort will be continued to the following operation. This may help to reduce uh, beam beam blow up. And uh, collimators uh, works well uh, to reduce the detected background. We need a more precise adjustment. And however, uh, difficulties arise uh, significantly, such as extremely short beam lifetime, stability of operations. Sextopole and octopole tuning have to be performed uh, to improve lifetime if the dynamic aperture affects it. The linear performance will be a key issue for the next autumn round to overcome one of the difficulties. Uh, beam background and inject, injector performance limit the beam current so far. The beam current uh, comes from the steward and uh, injector beam. I think 50% uh, for aerial beam, uh, the background 50% for aerial beam gas events. And uh, uh, the top counter uh, uses a uh, uh, March, uh, hot PMT, so we have to consider lifetime of the PMT. And uh, uh, the target for the next order run is whole time 10 to 34 by increasing beam currents. Uh, we consider to achieve uh, 10 to 35 until the end of 2021. Uh, thank you very much, that's it. Oh, thank you very much. You have uh, kept the good time timing. Uh, questions to you, Kiyoshi san? So uh, I have uh, uh, several questions if uh, there is no from audience. Uh, in the last table, you show the beam beam parameter evolution from the uh, beginning and the till now. So, uh, but a, a little bit confusing, you use the word so-called the design parameter. For example, mm -hmm. the, the final one, you put the one line, this is the final one. I mean, the, this yeah. is so-called the design. My question is, uh, what is achieved compared to this so-called design? Or so, you use this design as the final achieved experimentally. Yeah, the, yeah, of course, the target, uh, BME parameter 0.089 is a target, but the still the bounce current is uh, almost uh, uh, smaller than half, oh, about half of the final design bounce current. So BME parameter is about half, less than half. Okay, so that is uh, my question. So I never saw I have never, uh, I did not see uh, 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 the number of actual experimental obtained, the beam beam uh, number. Yeah. So, yeah. So, so, so you said it's half of this one, right? Yeah, but the HL beam beam parameter is slightly lower, point oh, around 0 0.02. So we want, we want to 0 0.04. Ah, so, so okay. Yeah, so but you, uh, in the area uh, about very close to the 0 0.04 we achieved. Okay, so anyway, this is a uh, halfway from the design goal. Yeah. Uh, sure, this is the luminosity is not yet uh, compared to your final goal. So there are many, so this is uh, something. Uh, another thing you said uh, in your conclusion, but with words without number to say that a very short lifetime. How yeah. about the actual lifetime now? The, the, the shortest. Uh, lifetime, yeah, maybe it's, I forgot to put the lifetime. I mean, maybe 20 minutes or so, 20 okay, minutes I, and uh, 30 minutes. Yeah, I, I think yeah. this is uh, reasonable. Uh, so, so in fact, uh, this is really the difficulties because now you're uh, 0.8 millimeter. If you squeeze down to smaller one, I mean, 200 micron, uh, of course, even three or anyway. Yeah. So this is yeah, very so difficult. The lifetime we, will be dropped yeah, off. The, it, yeah, design lifetime is about six, six minutes. Six minutes, ah. less than 10 minutes. Okay. 
Uh, so, uh, so we right? need a much improvement of the Linux injector injector performance. How about the, the, the lattice design and an aperture? If you reduce the beta y again, I, I'm afraid that you have a very small dynamic aperture and yeah. then you have almost zero. I think uh, dynamic aperture is not so a uh, problem because uh, uh, we, the physical aperture is very important for us because uh, in order to uh, reduce the beam background against the detector, so the collimator, movable collimator aperture is very, very small in the, in these operations. Okay. So the lifetime almost determined by the physical aperture so far. Okay. Okay, so thank you very much and uh, congratulations. So the first day of your operation, I was in KK. So to see <laughs> today, uh, you have, will reach this highly, I mean, uh, this uh, 800 milli, uh, Beta Y, so yeah. uh, this already a uh, big achievement. I mean, uh, for CPC, FCC, or uh, this uh, reference. Uh. Yeah, same so, level uh, of the Beta Y star of the CPC, FCC, I think. Yeah. <laughs> you are lower. <laughs> Those, uh, 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 <laughs> pilot, somehow, uh, some uh, yeah. pilot machine for the future career. <laughs> exactly. So this is As a crossing angle. Also. So yeah. thank you very much. Thank you very and, much. Uh, so we have uh, we kept uh, 20 minutes uh, exact time, and uh, now uh, we welcome uh, Bernard to talk about uh, uh, the the energy frontier. This at Sun. From Geneva, uh, you see my slide. Yes. Okay. It's always the first question because we never really trust these modern techniques. I will present an overview about the studies that are ongoing at CERN and collaborators on possible future projects uh, for deep inelastic scattering, uh, mainly for LHEC, so electrons colliding with the LHC proton beam, and then also an option for the future circular collider, 100 kilometer proton machine in electron proton collisions. I am talking on behalf clearly of a large team of colleagues that did these studies over the last years. It's a nice coincidence that uh, today the update of the conceptual design report, CDR, is available It's published on archive and I uh, got yesterday the, the link to this paper, which is available since now, basically. There's the front page on the lower right side. <clears throat> which is basically focusing on the Large Hadron Electron Collider and then possible FCCEH. Under the umbrella of these studies, we focus on three main possible scenarios. Uh, has been presented just some days ago in a snow mass conference by Max Klein and, and Oliver. Uh, so this is the LHEC, the FCCEH, and very important, the Perl uh, prototype machine. The LHEC is what I will focus today mainly. And you see here a sketch of the LHC collider and then three different ovals in, in yellow or orange showing qualitatively the geometry of the electron machine. So in the case of LHEC, we talk about 50 GeV versus 7 TeV protons. <clears throat> the operation, if we are optimistic, could start in 2035. And the CDR for this you have seen <clears throat> you have seen uh, just on the, on the first page. Um, in an upgrade, we focus for 10 to the 34 luminosity um, for Higgs and beyond the standard model, model physics. Very closely related to this is the Perle project, powerful energy recovery Linux for experiments, which is in the final design and starting construction phase in Orset. Again, here you see the CDR, uh, and this is very important for us because they use the same frequency for the RF system, <clears throat> 800 megahertz, 20 milliampere beam current, and an energy, final energy of 500 MeV. So indeed, this is a, a machine that will prove the, how do you say, feasibility of a high power energy recovery linear in our set. 
which will be then uh, you know, checked for the LHEC. And then on the right side, you see the FCC EH, uh, that means electrons on the level of 60 GeV colliding with 50 TeV protons. Um, you see here the sketch uh, of the FCC 100 kilometer proton machine in the Geneva Valley. And in black, you see here the Geneva Lake. Here in this talk, I will mainly focus on the LHEC, but for the electron side, the energy recovery machine accelerator will be more or less the same for all three options. We are still discussing the size of the machine, so not the beam dynamics, but the circumference, which in the end, because of limitations in synchron radiation and the impact on, on emittance and beam quality, uh, defines the reachable energy of the electrons. So we are studying uh, a machine, for example, with a third of the LHC circumference, nine kilometers roughly, which would get us to an electron energy of 60 GeV. Then there is an option, a fourth of LHC in the order of 50 GeV, and then a little bit smaller, a fifth of the LHC, um, shown as a uh, three circles here and a plot on the right bottom side. On the button on the left side, you see the first estimate calculations for the, for the money that it would cost the budget to foresee for the tunnel, the RF galleries and the shafts. It means the underground work in, in general. And it's clear the higher the energy um, of the electrons will be, the larger the tunnel has to be, and the higher is the cost for the construction of the tunnel. So money goes together with the energy reach of the physics that we can um, expect. This is still um, under discussion and uh, there basically the high energy physics colleagues have to express their opinion, how much money are we want, willing to, to spend to get, uh, to get the highest possible energy. Luminosity, the parameters are predefined by the LHC, the Large Hadron Collider in the high LUMI HLLHC version. Uh, so the electrons basically in their beam dynamics properties have to follow the conditions of the proton beam from LHC as easy as this. We have a certain bunch pattern in LHC, we have a certain beam size defined by the mini beta focus lattice of the LHC, and then we have to match the electron beam optics in a way that we have nicely well, well matched electron beam sizes in both planes at the IP. The luminosity then for such a machine is given by the number of electrons <clears throat> in a bunch times the number of protons, the, uh, the number of bunches stored in the machine, collision frequency, and then divided by the beam size. There is a luminosity modification or reduction factor H, capital H here in the equation, which is the hourglass factor, the pinch effect, that means this additional focusing that we get, which is positive, and the fill factor, the fact that LHC needs some space for a board gap and injection gaps, etc. Taking all these factors together, we are pretty close to one. So I will ignore them in the rest of this talk. So the luminosity is then defined by the properties of the LHC, proton number and collision frequency, and then the beam current that we can store in the, in the electron machine, the ERL. Okay, a very short main parameter list. Uh, here, I focus on an electron energy of 50 GeV colliding with the LHC protons, 7 TeV. Number of electrons per bunch is about three times 10 to the nine corresponding to an overall current in the machine of 20 milliampere at the interaction region. The proton parameters are defined by the upgrade version of the LHC, two times 10 to the 11 protons per bunch, about seven centimeter beta function at the collision point, and then the, the normalized emittance, 2.5 micrometers, which gives us then for these electron proton collisions, uh, a luminosity close to 10 to the 34, nine times 10 to the 33 on, on paper. Here is a parameter list, which is a little bit more detailed for your background information. I will not go through all these values here. This is just for bare information for those who are interested in, in more detailed uh, numbers. Uh, 
Again, 50 GeV, 20 milliampere. The circumference here is uh, the one divided by five of LHC, 5,300 meters. And then, as I said, the luminosity flows to 10 to the 34. Uh, remember, it is considering the energy 50 GeV a pretty compact machine. It is not a storage ring. It is an ERL, which allows us to be quite compact and so much cheaper. The circumference that I mentioned here, 5.3 kilometers, is even a bit smaller than the SPS, which is close to seven kilometers, as I mentioned here on the bottom left part. Okay, I will go briefly through some models <clears throat> of this LHEC um, project. Uh, the Linux DRF system, the frequency has been chosen 800 megahertz, five cell cavities with a gradient a little bit lower than 20 megavolts per meter. This brings us then to the required um, overall energy of, of 50 GeV. We have two Linux in this oval geometry. So two Linux combined by the arcs on the left and right side of the machine. And the energy gain, the acceleration energy per pass, the bottom line it's mentioned there, gives us 8.1 GeV per Linux. A uh, very nice uh, opportunity to present you the result of the first prototype tests, the cavity quality factor here on the right side on the top, Q0, measured at 2 Kelvin. We are running at about 20 um, MeV, 20 megavolts per meter. Uh, the quench limit is much higher in the order of 30, and the quality factor is pretty much constant between 10 and 20 MV per meter. This is a, a very new result and a collaboration between CERN and Chela, which gives us really a, quite some optimism. Okay, all in all, each cryo module contains, contains then four five cell cavities. Um, the challenge in the optimization of these cavities will be the large beam current. We have a three pass machine, three arcs, uh, that means all in all, we add up these 20 milliampere to 120 milliampere, a factor of six clearly. Uh, so these cavities have to be optimized for lowest higher order modes to, to guarantee the beam stability. All in all, we talk about 896 cavities running at the frequency of 802 megahertz, which is, I have been asked to, to tell you this just to to give you a kind of scaling, less than 10% of the ILC cavity needs. So again, a pretty compact machine that shows the advantage of this ERL concept. The optics of the Linux is somehow straightforward. This is a 130 degree photo structure here on the right side. You, you see it with the cryo module schematically included. The point is it has to be matched for the beam optics of the three energy steps in each Linux. We have two Linux, so we have six energy steps for the acceleration and the deceleration mode, because after the interaction point, the beam will run in decelerating RF phase through the cavities, putting back the energy or the biggest part of the beam energy back into the RF system, which is what the ERL defines then. The arcs, here the highest <clears throat> priority the, and the challenge is the emittance preservation. We are far away from reaching the equilibrium emittance as we usually do in a damping ring or in a, in a ring collider. So we take the emittance as defined by the particle source and the only thing that we can do is to preserve it and handle it with care through the acceleration then through the arcs, which is the main problem, the spreaders where we distribute the beam into the, <clears throat> through the three return arcs, and then after the IP through the decelerating phase. We all know that the emittance increase is defined by this sense curly H function H, which is then again defined by the dispersion and the optical functions as I showed here. Uh, therefore, it has been chosen for the low energy arcs arc one to three, and the high energy arcs four to six different beam optics. In the low energy case, <coughs> the, arc, the arcs uh, are powered in an isochronous optics mode to keep the bunch lengthening 
punch elongation as small as possible. For the high energy arcs, however, we have to take care for the, for the emittance because the quantum effects of the synchronon light, they are very high. So here, um, basically this is um, de designed by Alex Bogash in, in JLab. Uh, a theoretical minimum emittance type that is, has been chosen, and I show you both optics here on the, on the right side um, for a single cell. Okay, then after the arc or after the linear, we have to run the beams through spreaders and recombiners to distribute them according to the energy into their appropriate arc. So the lowest energy uh, beam after the first pass through the linac will be guided to the highest arc. And then for the highest energy, we basically go straight forward in, in arc number, what is it, um, five and six. Uh, these spreaders um, have been optimized since 2012. We go now for a non-dispersive, that means achromatic vertical deflection system. Um, gently matched uh, for the beam optics between the linux and the arcs and I show you the latest result of the optics match on the right side on the bottom here. Uh, here a lot of care has been done especially to preserve the vertical emittance because this spread, spreader spectrometer dipole which is mentioned here in the, in the schematic plot uh, creates clearly quite some signal radiation. It has to be strong enough to provide sufficient separation in the three arcs, which are one on top of the other. And on the other side, we have to avoid an emittance blow up here, which is um, intolerable. Uh, synchronous light and emittances. And here for once, I mentioned two names. Uh, for the CDR, there are 337 authors and you can have a look at them. But for the synchronous light, there are two people that provide a lot of calculations and simulations. This is uh, Daniel Clayton and, and Daniel Henstock from Liverpool. They are internship students at CERN at the moment and, and working with me on, on this concept. So they established um, analytically and, uh, and in simulations a complete synchronous light catalog for the machine for all arcs, spreaders, bypass, interaction region, etc. So just to show you, to point out the problem. Excuse me, we used up 15 minutes of presentation, so be careful time. Ah, merci. Um, we have to take care for the critical energy that is not too high. Here are the equations. So we have to optimize the, the whole machine in a way that we keep the critical energy low enough. And here is an example for a fourth LHC design size for the different arcs and, and energies. Okay, the interaction region then for the protons is basically the HLLHC uh, proton optics, which is shown here. For the electrons, this is new, and here we have to combine the beam separation scheme, that means again a source of signal radiation and possible emittance dilution, with the mini beta concept. And uh, we have a new design based on separation dipoles here on the left and off center quadrupoles to keep critical energy and emittance effects as small as possible. One of these optimization scans that has been done uh, is here on the right side to optimize the parameters of this separation scheme. The beam emit interaction has been studied. You see here on the left uh, button, the effective beam size without and including the beam beam effect and a phase space diagram on the right side, which will be used then in uh, XX prime, YY prime for the deceleration for the energy recovery mode then to track down again to the injection energy. Okay, the next challenge is uh, we are, I would say pretty fine in the beam dynamics calculations. What will come then as next challenges and studies is the design for prototypes of the special machine elements, half quadrupoles in the interaction region, spectrometer dipole and the spreader, which has to be quite compact, 800 megahertz cavities for high current operation, which goes along with the parallel design, as I said. Synchronous light is always uh, an issue in that kind of machine. And then the machine detector interface, how to protect the detector from the synchronous light that um, has been produced. Summary and conclusion. In 2012, a first CDR has been written. 
it is updated and published today, nice coincidence, more than 300 authors. Um, it considers and describes the physics, the accelerator, the Perlin prototype machine, and then the detector. Here, I focused on the arc structure, synchronon light catalog, beam spreaders, emittance budget, and the interaction region optimized. Two final statements, the update CDR and the Perlin project, they show the way to a TDR of the LHEC machine. Uh, I'm convinced that the energy recovery linear is really a key future accelerator technique. It's very efficient and goes a little bit in the direction of green accelerators. Uh, with the LHEC and the later possible FCC EH, uh, we get the highest resolution microscopes for deep inelastic scattering one may build with a striking potential on Higgs beyond the standard model top and nuclear physics. Here on the right side, the last plot, you see the improvement in coverage on, on the kinematic plane in deep inelastic scattering between, for example, HERA, LHEC, and FCC EH. Thank you. That's it from my side. Yeah, thank you, Bernard. And uh, due to the time limitation, so we would collect uh, one or two questions from audience. Questions? So if not, I would uh, propose uh, ask uh, one question to Bernard and uh, uh, about uh, the beam beam, uh, you show the number of uh, P and E for, for the proton, which is uh, in the order of minus uh, uh, 10 to minus four and uh, uh, to E uh, to electron is about one. So my question is uh, for proton and electron, in fact, uh, which one is the limiting? Um, okay, this is, <laughs> they are both limiting. We can show and we optimize the parameters that in case of the protons, we are far in the shadow of the high luminosity experiments, Atlas and CMS. So compared to what the protons see in the other IPs, the contribution from the LHEC is not very high. In the case of the electrons, I showed you this phase-based plot. And here, indeed, we push due to the high bunch population of the protons and a very high energy proton beam, uh, the beam beam parameter to a limit where we see then the onset of losses during the energy recovery process. Going down in energy after the IP means the emittance is increasing. And so this is a possible source of particle loss and inefficiency for the EIL process. So here, in case of the electron beam beam parameter, we have to be careful uh, not to require too much. Yeah, I think uh, your answer is, uh, is reasonable. Yeah, thank you very much. So Welcome. yeah, so the next speaker is Phil. So Phil, you are here. Yes, I'm here. Uh, can you hear me okay, uh, G? Yes, uh, voice is good, and uh, so you can put in the full screen and uh, to move a little bit to the second page and go back to the first to see whether it works. Does it work? It works. So please start from beginning. Yes, thank you. Okay, thank you very much indeed, uh, Mr. Chairman, and good morning, everybody. So it's my pleasure to uh, present the status and plans of the CLIC accelerator project. I'm speaking on behalf of the uh, CLIC collaborations um, and uh, the last time that uh, most of the collaboration gathered uh, was, was last year. We've not been able to do that so far this year, but you see, you see many of our collaborators here. So the outline uh, of the presentation is, uh, is shown here. So um, I'm going to give a very brief overview of the, uh, of the CLIC project. Um, I'll talk about the technical maturity, the implementation of the CLIC design, our plans for the coming years, and then um, I'll give uh, a brief summary at the end. So I think most people are probably quite familiar uh, with the CLIC project, but in brief, um, it's a very timely project. So we are proposing an E plus E minus linear collider at CERN for the post LHC era. It's based on a, a very novel, unique uh, two-beam accelerating technique 
uh, using high gradient room temperature RF cavities. And the first stage, the 380 GeV stage, would be 11 kilometers in length. And we have this staged approach to collision energy starting at 380 GeV for a Higgs and top factory with the possibility to extend up to 3 TeV. The cost for the first stage is about 5.9 billion Swiss francs. So it's roughly comparable with the cost of the LHC uh, in today's money. And the uh, wall plug power for the first stage is about 168 uh, megawatts, which again is well within the current um, power capability installed at CERN. The project is very well documented. We published the CDR in 2012, uh, an updated baseline in 2016, and most recently the project implementation plan uh, in 2018. And of course, there are, there's a lot of work going on on physics and detector studies, uh, which have been presented in other talks at this conference. Just for reference, here are the documents that we prepared for input to the European strategy. So there are four yellow reports. Uh, a huge amount of documentation, an overview, physics and detector, excuse me, physics overview, machine overview, and detector uh, overview and R&D. And then these are the two documents that were submitted to the European strategy process. And you can find all of these, uh, this documentation at this reference here. And of course, we are also engaging with the SNOMAS process in the United States, and we are preparing letters of interest for, for CLIC uh, for SNOMAS. So this shows you the, the layout of the machine as it's envisaged uh, in the region of CERN. So the first stage, the 380 GeV stage, is a little bit larger than the diameter of the LHC. And here you see the possibility to extend the Linux uh, to the full uh, roughly 50 kilometer footprint of the 3 TV machine uh, just at the foot of the uh, Jura Mountains. Uh, the concept of CLIC, again, it, I think it's probably reasonably familiar, and it, it, this is a, a diagram that shows you the uh, layout of 3TV. You can see it's quite, uh, <coughs> it's quite complex, but the idea is very simple. You have uh, a drive beam accelerator, which has a rather low energy but high power uh, um, uh, drive beam and you decelerate the drive beam in a series of decelerating sections and you transfer the power to accelerate the main beam at roughly 12 gigahertz uh, frequency using x-band structures so it's a very novel concept a two beam uh, accelerator with a drive beam and uh, a main beam accelerated to high energy the layout at the first stage 380 gv uh, uh, looks uh, significantly simpler there's a single uh, drive beam which is able to feed uh, both of the electron and positron linux and there are four of these decelerating sections per uh, beam giving a total site length including the um, interaction region and so on of roughly 11 kilometers the parameters are shown here. I'm not going to, to go through these uh, parameters in any detail, but just to remind you that um, for the first stage, um, the optimum, the cost optimum accelerating gradient is about 72 megavolts per meter. And then for the higher energy stages, we are targeting um, 100 MeV per meter with the possibility to use the, the structures from the first stage. The luminosity target is 1.5 times 10 to the 34 at 380 GeV, rising to 610 to the 34 at uh, 3 TeV. So uh, if these parameters are there for reference in case anybody has any questions. So this is how we would imagine uh, staging the machine. And this shows the luminosity profile, starting off with the first stage. So there's an initial ramp up of luminosity as we learn how to, to run and commission the machine and then steady state operation for roughly a, a total of eight years. And so the plan would be to operate at 380 GeV with a dedicated run at the TT bar threshold, 350 GeV, to collect roughly one inverse atabans of uh, data with then uh, the option, as physics dictates, to go to the higher energy stages and to collect uh, further data at higher energy. <clears throat> now, of course, there are many challenges associated with the accelerator design itself. I can only give a very brief summary, but, but if you like, there are four principal challenges. There's to produce the high current drive beam and to bunch it at 12 gigahertz. There's to transfer power from the drive beam to the main beam. There's to achieve this 100 megavolts per meter gradient in the main beam cavities. And then there are many issues associated with the alignment and stability 
um, of the beams. So um, all of these challenges have been addressed at a number of test facilities. So CTF3, the click test facility, addressed all of the drive beam production issues. This X-band 12 gigahertz technology has been developed and verified uh, through prototypes and through system tests and test stands at, at uh, CERN and in China and, uh, and Japan and many other places. There are two um, currently operating C-band um, uh, X-ray free electron lasers, Sackler and Swissfell, and these provide uh, huge uh, facilities, large scale facility demonstrations uh, for uh, normal conducting high frequency uh, low emittance uh, Linux. And so we are learning a lot uh, from these machines. And then many of the other critical is issues, alignment uh, issues, uh, for example, damping rings, beam delivery, and so on. These have been addressed at other facilities such as um, ATF and uh, FACET. Now, power is, of course, a concern for, for all um, modern high energy accelerators. And we've done a bottoms up power estimate uh, for click, these are the numbers for the 380 GV uh, first stage. And you can see in the pie chart uh, on the left how the power is distributed. The total wall plug power for the first stage is about 168 megawatts, which is certainly uh, well within the installed site power capacity of CERN. And you can see how the power is distributed among the different uh, areas of the machine. Now, many people are also interested um, in the idea of a, of a klystron, an all klystron based a version of clicks, so you would do away with the drive beam in this in this case and replace it with a system of modulators and klystrons. Interestingly, the wall plug power turns out to be uh, more or less the same, 164 megawatts. And basically what you've done is you've traded off the power in the drive beam system here on the left, and you've replaced it with the power in the conventional modulator and klystron system shown on the right. So the power is very similar for both uh, the, the baseline click machine, the two beam machine, and the uh, klystron option. And of course, we're all, all re always looking to, at saving power and so we are looking in particular at, at how if we can uh, um, be more efficient in the damping rings, we are looking at high efficiency klystrons, the use of permanent magnets, and we are reviewing the numbers for one and a half and three TeV. Now, if you take the power uh, budget and you fold that with the running model, uh, of the machine, you get the energy consumption. So this shows the, the assumed run model with number of days for different periods. So for example, data taking is about 140 days a year. Um, and uh, then you have the annual shutdown, you have uh, stoppages for faults and so on. So this is, is how we imagine the calendar time would be distributed. And you fold that with the power and you arrive then uh, at the uh, energy consumed by the machine. And so what you can see here for the first stage, 380 GeV is the, the actual energy consumption in terawatt hours. And the current uh, click, uh, a CERN um, energy consumption is about 1.2 terawatt hours per year. So we're significantly below that for the first stage. But of course, uh, we have to look more carefully at the higher energy stages uh, to try to reduce this, uh, this energy bill. And that we are doing. So we've done a, a very detailed uh, bottoms up costing of the accelerator and the numbers are shown here for the first stage. The bottom line is that the first stage cost is roughly 5.9 billion Swiss francs in CERN core cost accounting. And you can see how that's distributed across the, the different areas of the machine uh, shown here. And there's a, a table if you're interested in the details. Uh, again, many people are interested in this possibility to, to replace the drive beam with klystrons, and we've looked at the cost of an all klystron first stage, and interestingly, it's significantly higher. And it's in fact dominated, this difference is dominated by the cost of the, of the klystrons uh, in the uh, current cost of the klystrons for the RF system. So we believe that the baseline design, as we understand it presently with the two beam scheme, uh, is, is certainly cheaper than uh, an all klystron based option. Of course, there are other elements to the cost. So we've looked um, at the uh, estimate for labor costs, which we estimate to be about 11,500 FTEs uh, for the first stage. And then if you want to go to the higher energy stages, if physics dictates that we should go to one and a half TV or three TV, of course, you need to lengthen the, the main Linux of the machine and upgrade other aspects of the complex. And so you would need to add roughly 5 billion to go to one and a half TV and roughly 7 billion, uh, another 7 billion to go to uh, three TV. Uh, we've looked at the cost of operation uh, and it's roughly 116 million Swiss francs per year, uh, plus the cost of electricity 
for the first stage. So all of this is, is a very detailed um, estimates of cost and power and so on, which has all been uh, re presented in the CDR and reviewed internationally. And so I think this, this summary take home message for Click is that the key technologies have been demonstrated. It's a mature project and we are ready to move towards implementation of this uh, Higgs and Top Factory uh, first stage at 380 GeV. The technical schedule is shown here. So from a decision to, to go ahead with the project, we think we would need roughly seven years for construction, installation, and commissioning. And then we would in initially plan to run for roughly eight years at 380 GeV, including a top threshold scan. And then of course, physics will dictate uh, whether we need to have additional running at the higher energy stages. But this is the technical schedule as shown here. Now, I think you're all aware that recently the European strategy has been updated, and so I, I just pass a couple of comments on that. So uh, I just show a few comments extracted from the strategy. Um, so the vision is to repair a Higgs factory. Well, we are certainly consistent with that. And indeed, more specifically, an E plus E minus Higgs factory is the highest priority next collider. And the first stage of click is exactly that. Um, the strategy comments on innovative accelerated technology, not least high gradient accelerating structures, and we are addressing that in CLIC. And then there's a second document, the deliberation document, in which it's stated very clearly that the design, technology, and implementation aspects of CLIC indicate that the first stage, the Higgs factory, could be realized within 15 years and extended to higher energies. So we completely agree with that statement. And then again, there's a statement about the importance of uh, normal conducting high gradient accelerating structures. So the CLIC R&D and design work is fully consistent with the European strategy and aligned with it. And indeed, uh, this work will continue um, over the next uh, five years in the medium term planning uh, presently um, uh, under discussion at CERN. So let me just close with a couple of slides on some more recent studies. We've been looking at the performance at the Z pole, uh, where it looks possible to get a higher luminosity than um, our uh, default um, assumption. We've been looking at gamma gamma collisions and there's an example of the luminosity spectrum shown here. We're looking at the luminosity margins. And if you go from our baseline luminosity, 1.5, 10 to the 34, the perfect machine after the damping ring, in fact, would have a luminosity roughly three times higher. And so there's a significant margin for improvement. And we're looking at our uh, uh, beam-based alignment techniques, our wake field steering um, uh, um, uh, and uh, other steering and tuning techniques to see if we can capitalize and increase the luminosity taking advantage of this margin. We're looking at upgrades. Um, in a sense, the conceptually easiest way to double the luminosity would be to double the frequency. And that actually looks reasonably promising. The cost increase is only about 5% and it's a roughly 50 megawatt increase in wall plug power. So we're always looking at to improve the performance of the machine. And these are some of the promising ideas under study. Um, uh, we are looking at the uh, possibility of higher efficiency klystrons. This was mentioned uh, by, by uh, G. Gao yesterday. And so now we are designing klystrons with a significantly higher efficiency uh, in excess of 80%, uh, which would be a benefit not only to CLIC, but to, to many other accelerators as well. We're looking at the industrial production of the CLIC accelerating structures, and an industrial survey shows the capacity is clearly available, and it would take roughly five years to ramp up to a stage of mass production. So then in closing, um, let me just point to the click studies for the coming years. There's a lot of work going on um, on X-band uh, technology. You can read the details here, not only for click, but structures um, uh, for other applications. And so there are many applications of the X-band technology, including compact free electron lasers, medical Linux, inverse Compton scattering sources, and so on. And some of these projects are shown here. And so we are working very closely. We are plugged into many of these projects uh, to spin off and apply the uh, uh, high gradient uh, X-band technology. And then there are many technical and experimental studies going on, looking at the injector, uh, um, optimizing the design of other click modules, but also for other applications. Lots of work on beam dynamics. The clear test facility, which is the new incarnation of CTF3, will continue to run, looking at wake fields and instrumentation and other issues. And we also work at ATF2 at KEK, uh, looking at the production of nanobeams. And I mentioned already the high efficiency klystrons. So in summary then, CLIC is a mature project um, and 380 GeV initial stage is ready for implementation. We think the physics case is broad and profound and of course it's being developed further. The cost and implementation time are similar to those for the LHC 
is a very well advanced detector concept uh, and a lot of work going on on detector R&D. All of the details you can find in uh, this link here. And then in summary, let me just say that Click offers a staged and flexible approach towards the energy frontier. It keeps open other options. So it's certainly not in conflict with building um, circular colliders um, or uh, indeed a muon collider. And it provides a path to very high energies um, uh, in lepton collisions as the accelerating technology advances. So for the present click baseline design, we think we can get to three TV with the 100 megavolt per meter X-band structures. Um, but of course, uh, um, if you think very far ahead, you could reuse much of this infrastructure to get to perhaps very high energies based upon, for example, Wakefield acceleration techniques. So I'll stop there. Thank you to all of uh, my collaborators for their support. And then I'm very happy to take uh, any questions. Thank you very much. So thank you very much, Phil. Very good presentation. So questions from audience? So Phil, about the, the high efficiency Klystrom, uh, so what is the status now? It's already in the factory or? Let me see if I can find this. So um, what's shown here, let me see if I can get rid of this. Um, yeah, so this is the present uh, design, um, the latest design from Igor and um, colleagues. Um, the chart is a bit complicated, but the, um, this line shows the efficiency projection for, the, for this design, and the dashed line here shows um, the uh, efficiency for an actual uh, device uh, which, um, which has been uh, built and tested. So 70% so has been achieved with the actual uh, previous prototype. This is the upgraded one, and uh, the projection is that we can even get beyond 80%. So this is now in development. Okay, thank you. Other questions? So if not, uh, let's uh, thank uh, Phil again. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you. And uh, the next speaker is uh, Jenny on the polarized beam. Yes, good morning. Good morning, everybody. Uh, why are, oh, sorry, why are we at the last one? Don't understand this. And here. Uh, yeah, it's a pleasure um, for me to talk about and uh, discuss the role of polarized beams at future E plus E minus colliders. And uh, in, uh, huh, now it works. Okay, good. So um, for future E plus E minus colliders and in particular, of course, Higgs factories, um, Longitudinally polarized beams are really um, a special feature of, of uh, linear colliders. And uh, uh, both ILC and CLIC foresee 80% of polarization for, for the electron beam, and ILC actually also envisions a polarization for the positron beam. So, this is of course interesting because any electroweak interaction is highly sensitive to the chirality of, of the fermions due to the L in our beloved SU2L cross U1 of the standard model. Um, and thus every cross section of every reaction depends on the beam polarizations. And uh, so ILC with both beams polarized is so to say four colliders in one, depending on which, uh, which configurations of, 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 the, uh, of the chiralities actually collide. Um, so this has four effects. You can, with this, suppress backgrounds. You can enhance signals. You can actually analyze the chiral structure of, of, of the collisions. And I think what is, what is um, least well known is actually that it's also important uh, for redundancy and control of systematics. Because if you choose the sort of wrong polarization with respect to your signal, you can get sort of a signal-free um, control sample. 
and uh, especially this applies for the positron polarization um, if you want to use the electron polarization for the chiral analysis so you have another degree of freedom there essential for this is the ability to uh, quickly reverse uh, the helicity for both beams and uh, so this means in the end of the day uh, that this allows you to trade theory or detector systematics versus polarization systematics which um, we think we can control very well uh, which will be the second half of the talk so let's continue with uh, why we actually want this so obviously at every higgs factory uh, the key process is, is higgs strahlung production of a z and a higgs boson and uh, the standard model diagram, which you see um, on the left side, um, uh, is, is this one here. And But if you go to a general analysis and effective field theory, you could have other diagrams. Now, the point is, if you spin flip uh, uh, the, the chirality of the electron beam, then the first diagram flips its sign, the second diagram keeps its sign. So this means that the, the left-right asymmetry of these cross-sections really lifts the degeneracy between operators in effective field theory. And the, the result of this uh, then goes into all these famous plots, which you have probably seen of Higgs couplings, precision uh, for various uh, uh, couplings to various particles. And uh, um, of course, uh, the example I mentioned, of course, here mostly concerns the gauge bosons. And what is important to see here is that the uh, that the green bars, which correspond to, to the typical ILC scenario with two inverse autobahn uh, polarized, are as high as the red bars, which are uh, five times uh, five inverse autobahn, but without the polarization. And they are most of the time equally high, roundabout. Um, so, so polarization buys you a factor 2.5 here in luminosity. And of course, higher energies improve this even further. Um, so for the chiral analysis, the, the most um, famous example are, of course, the simple uh, two fermion production, uh, as you can see here in the diagram. And the, the, the vertex on the right-hand side actually hides four different couplings, depending on whether you have a photon or a Z exchange and produce um, left-handed or right-handed fermions. And um, uh, this is captured typically in a, a symmetry uh, AF for the final state and specifically for the electron. Uh, this, uh, so on at the initial state vertex, this relates directly to the electroweak mixing angle. So at an unpolarized collider, you can use the angular distributions, the forward backward symmetry, but this gives you only the product of the initial state and final state helicity. While at the polarized collider, you can um, have an additional observable from the polarization, and this allows you to separately determine the, the couplings in the initial state and in the final state. So um, this is, uh, and in addition, you can also trade here polarization against theory uncertainty because actually the polarized asymmetry receives much smaller radiative corrections than the unpolarized uh, uh, version uh, from, the, from the tree level um, equations given here on this slide. So a more concrete example of exactly this effect here for top pair production, you really see the disentanglement of the Z and photon exchange in the top production uh, on this plot. So this shows the, the precisions achievable on, on various form factors, which is equivalent more or less to the, to the couplings, uh, the chiral couplings. Um, and you see in red, the Hailumi LHC projection, the most recent one, and then in, in blue, uh, the polarized case for the ILC and in green, the FCCE uh, projections, which are unpolarized with roughly the same uh, luminosity in this case. And uh, you can clearly, um, you can clearly see the, the advantage of using the, the, the polarization and not only the, the final state analysis. The second example is, uh, is uh, from the same process for any difermions, you can uh, look out for, for four fermion operators, the so four point interactions. And this is captured in, in an extension of the standard oblique parameters called Y and, and W. And here you can see um, in particular um, that the polarization is essential to, to beat down the correlations between the two parameters. Here, this is this. this column labeled row. So this goes down by more than a factor two with polarization. 
and actually um, in the polarized version already the the first stage of the ILC here really outperforms um, LHC significantly. Um, this was sort of electrophysics at high energies. You can of course also do this at lower energies at the Z pole, and typically here um, the the moderate giga z assumption already uh, gives you a factor of 10, sometimes even 50 improvement over the current knowledge from NAP and SLC. I'd like to highlight in particular the charm asymmetry, which gets nearly factor 100 better thanks to excellent charm uh, tagging um, based on, of course, the advances in vertex detectors, but also due to the tiny ILC beam spot and the k on ID, um, which is possible via the specific energy loss in ILD's time projection chamber. If you compare the, the red ILC to the, the gray FCC Terra Z bars, you see that, of course, a factor of thousand of more luminosity gives you better results, but actually it's only uh, a factor two to three um, better, which means that uh, polarization here buys you a factor of hundred roundabout in luminosity. Um, final example from BSM. So for, for dark matter searches in the monophoton channel, uh, polarization uh, tunes down the standard model backgrounds by a factor of 10, as you can see here um, in the plot. Uh, but at least uh, as important is the fact that all these distributions also depend on the, uh, on the sign of the polarization combination, which helps you to beat down systematics if you then combine them. And this you can see here uh, in this example where you can see the, the, the new physics scale probe, so in this case, higher bars are better, different uh, running scenarios sorted by energy. And if you look, for instance, here, you can see that the unpolarized versions uh, uh, um, really don't reach any further, even if they have much higher luminosity. Yeah, So like here at, in this example, uh, 10 inverse atoban unpolarized is not any better than only 200 inverse femtoban polarized. On the other hand, uh, of course, energy helps as another feature of linear colliders. Um, uh, once you increase the energy for any search, this is of course very helpful. So how do we do this? Um, I mean, the source design is, is known um, since a long time and published in the TDR. I would like to highlight here in particular the, the spin uh, rotation section before the damping ring for the positron side. Uh, which uh, has been redesigned post uh, TDR to implement this fast helicity reversal, which I've been mentioning. And uh, as you can see here, this is uh, this is done in two with two different beam lines uh, with a kicker which switches between them, which obviously tells you that this reversal can never be perfect. So the absolute values will differ somewhat, and we will see later th uh, that we can handle this easily. Um, so for the polarization. Uh, measurement, um, we can exploit these, these benefits, own physics benefits only if we know the, the polarization really at a per mil level. And we achieve this by combining three things, namely Compton polarimeters, which are located upstream and downstream of the interaction point. Uh, we use spin tracking simulations to relate these measurements and then uh, combine this with collision data from the main interaction point. And there, of course, the crucial question is, which I will show you, um, is that we can disentangle this uh, from, uh, from new physics effects. So copper polarimeters measure, uh, provide a fast measurement. You get an order of a thousand scatterings per bunch. And uh, uh, the energy spectrum of the scattered electrons depends on the product of, of a beam and laser polarization, and you measure the symmetry with respect to, to the laser helicity. Do this by uh, using a magnetic uh, chicane to translate the energy distribution into a position distribution. Um, the, uh, the uncertainty which we think we can reach is about a quarter of a percent on the polarization at the polarimeter location. And you see in the table a, a breakdown of, of, uh, of the budget compared uh, to SLC. Uh, so this is typically a moderate improvement, uh, which has been studied in detail. And I don't have time to explain this, but um, uh, this is uh, we think this is well under control. Um, and uh, 
We have two parameters per beam, which have very uh, complementary properties. So uh, the upstream polarimeter has a, has a very clean environment, benign beam condition, and samples really every bunch, uh, and is very fast. On the other hand, the downstream polarimeter gives you access to the depolarization and collision and has to face, uh, um, uh, on the other hand, a bit tougher beam conditions. So the combination of these two really without collisions uh, uh, gives you direct access to, to really understand the, the spin transport and the beam delivery system and the extraction line, while with the collisions you really uh, can uh, measure the depolarization at the IP. Um, so for the spin tracking, a tool has been developed called STALK, Spin Transport at Linear Colliders. This is based on, on, on BMAT with uh, interfaces to the polarimeter simulations and to guinea pig for beam beam uh, um, uh, simulations. And uh, um, an example result is, for instance, the cross calibration of the polarimeters without collisions where you can see here from the breakdown in the table, which effects have all been studied and uh, that um, you get uh, less than a per mil uncertainty from, from all of the studied effects. Um, coming finally to the polarization from the collision data. So a classic approach which has been studied for a long time is to use one polarization dependent process, for instance, W pair production and determine then polarize the polarization and possibly other important parameters like charge crippled gauge couplings, which are BSM sensitive. This works because um, uh, typically central scattering gives you uh, sensitivity to new physics while scattering in the very forward region uh, gives, uh, is determined by the polarization. Um, more recently, um, we extended these studies to uh, global fits to many differential cross sections of, of basically all uh, two fermion and four fermion processes and determine then the polarization values, cross-section asymmetries, and charge triple gauge coupling simultaneously. All this does not rely on perfect helicity reversal, but determines four independent polarization values. And this you can, uh, this you can nicely see here on the left-hand plot um, for the two electron polarization values, where you can nicely distinguish the perfect helicity reversal at 80%, 80% from sort of any other offset uh, uh, from the exact um, flip. And in all this still, the polarimeter uh, constraint is polarimeter measurement contributes significantly, as you can see here on the upper plot by combine, comparing the full lines uh, with the dashed ones, which include the polarimeter constraint. Um, so uh, I showed you this for the electron polarization, but actually you can reach this per mil level for all the four uh, polarizations, as you can see here from the from the blue uh, crosses, and uh, um, this is, uh, this shows you actually a bit the complexity of this whole analysis because this is the graphical um, display of the correlation matrix of all the fit parameters, and uh, the only thing I want to highlight here is that this box in the upper right corner is actually more or less empty showing zero correlations uh, between uh, the polarization and actually the luminosity um, and uh, parameters which are sensitive to new physics, namely triple gauge couplings and here some symmetries. So which tells you that there is a sort of no conflict between possible BSM contributions and a precise determination of the polarization. This brings me to my conclusions. Uh, so I hope I showed you that beam polarization is an integral part of the linear collider physics case or in Higgs and in, in electroweak at high energies and at the Z-pole and for BSM. This requires the knowledge of the polarization at the per mil level. And, uh, and we have a concept for, the, for reaching this, uh, which combines polarimeter spin tracking and global analysis of uh, collision data. So, um, and uh, so we have this under control and can fully profit from its advantages. And I close with a list of, of uh, talks I referenced and uh, uh, tomorrow afternoon, we offer actually a Zoom session to discuss further questions uh, on all these ILC related talks. Thank you. So thank you very much, Jenny. So questions?
Any questions to Jenny on polarization? Uh, I, I raised my hand. Hi. Oh, sorry, please. Yeah. I did not... Hi. Yeah. So this is actually also a question to Phil. Um, as far as I recall, all these ILC and also clicks, they are really, let's say, nanometer beams where the collisions, it's, let's say, each collision is, is like a new collider. So what I'm now like to ask is how you fold in time stability. Yeah, the stability over time. This is either for the polarization, which acts then like the luminosity stability over time, or then if you have unpolarized beam, then it's for the luminosity itself. Now, how is this controlled to this high level of precision if one considers that one has these nanometer beams that collide again and again. Yeah, I mean, like, this like, is of course considered, uh, considered Uta, I think Phil is the expert to answer for the luminosity uh, stabilization um, for, for, for the polarimeters. I can tell you this is exactly one of the, the, the reasons why we, um, uh, why we have, for instance, uh, why the polarimeters are so important in, in the measurement because the, the um, ups, and particularly the upstream polarimeter can basically measure polarization for, for any two subsequent bunches, if you want. Yeah, so then of course, with a bit larger statistical uncertainty, um, but still in principle, you can completely profile, time profile, even what happens during one bunch train. And you for sure can control this on a train by train basis, but even even uh, the development during the train can be measured. Yeah, and it would of course be naive to just say we don't need polarimeters that just take this from the from the long term average from from collision data. Right. So this is exactly why we need uh, why we think we need this combination. Yeah? And of course, for the, for is, it, is it then really at this level of precision? Because I'm doing this atlas also, this <laughs> exactly, and, and we have, and there's the dominant systematic uncertainties are really then the, anything which is related to calibration transfers. Let's say, even as you also pointed out that, of course you can measure in the non-colliding beams, yeah, like, like the absolute calibration. And, and then of course in collision, there is, the, the polarization is different in collision, as you pointed out. And this is then again, if there is the transfer and if this is then everything controlled really below the per mil level, it's, it's let's say, it's still a little bit hard to believe. Well, I mean, the, the, ultimate, uh, the ultimate test will, of course, be to, 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 to build the machine. I, all I can tell you is that we simulate a lot of time dependent effects, also like ground motion, like, uh, uh, yeah, like, uh, yeah, other misalignments, which might change and uh, uh, an important and, and uh, yeah, as, fa as far as one can simulate all these effects, they, they are considered and, uh, and seem to be under control. I think one important thing in all this is, for instance, exactly also this fast helicity reversal, because we could absolutely not achieve this level of precision if we would flip the, the spin like it was done at Hera by yeah, going into the tunnel and moving magnets around and doing this you know, every two to three months. Yeah? Then, of course, you would be lost due to the time-dependent effects you mentioned. Yeah? So I think this, the, the, this ability to, to train by train really reverse, uh, uh, reverse um, the polarization is, is really important here also for, for this time, controlling these time dependent effects. Okay, so maybe we, uh, this subject we can continue tomorrow as Jenny indicates. So there is an, another discussion yes. time. So thank you very much, uh, Jenny. So let's uh, welcome uh, the, the speaker, Angela. Hi, good morning everyone. So would you please share? Okay. Yes, I guess that you are seeing my slides. Yes, go ahead. Yeah, so then before starting, I would like to thank the organizer for giving us the possibility to report about the most recent results we got after having changed the main immune target production in the context of the high intensity immune project beam at PSI. So let me just to then 
remind you, let's say what we are talking about. Let's say PSI is actually delivering the highest intensity muon beam in the world at low energy with an intensity up to this five times 10 to eight muons per second. And aim would be to actually match the 10 10 muons per, per second in a time schedule that will be basically in the next year. And this is in order to address, uh, first of all, a lot of uh, experiment from the particle physics sites like uh, future charge electron flavor violation experiment, but not only, also a neonium based experiment, and also open the possibility for new opportunity from the material science of all experiment based on the new SR technique. Now, let me remind you that actually on the board already, we know that the there are other places where people are pushing for increased muon beam like Fermilab and J Park. But it's also true that in this case, while we are talking about, let's say, past beam, in our case, we will stay and remain focused on continuous low energy muon beam. And this is basically because actually different experiment demand for a different beam characteristics. So basically um, past versus continuous. And also, let's say, another important parameter is the energy energy of the beam itself. So in this respect, actually, PSI is pushing for a keeping and maintain the leadership in this low energy continuous uh, immune beam. And here, just an example of uh, the difference in terms of, uh, for example, a high beam intensity in terms of the time characteristics past versus continuous. And now if we are going to refer to charge electron flavor violation experiment, if we are interested, for example, on pushing on the research based on the new e-conversion for sure, a past beam would be the best choice. While if you are interested more on a, a new gamma decay, new to three decay, where then more than one particle is in the final state for sure, let's say continuous muon beam would be the best. And the reason is associated to the control of the background. So now back to a PSI, this is actually the PSI landscape and this is Hertz, which is represented by the proton ring cyclotron with a power equivalent to one point four a megawatt. So this is what you would see if you would visit us. Everything starts with the Echo-Volton accelerator. Here is the path of the protons beam going through the Rick cyclotron. And here we have the two immune target production, the so-called target M here and the so-called target E here. And then finally, the beam is dumped in what we call the neutron spallation source. So then um, Basically, let's say in our in our case, let's say the machine works in order to produce, let's say, this surface muon beam, which are polarized, as we can quickly uh, reconnect to the fact that they come from the uh, pion uh, decay. And actually, let's say in this case, the surface muon beam are associated only, let's say, to the uh, positive uh, muon uh, beam. And uh, in terms of actually, let's say, the heat project itself, so then our first starting point was to uh, start with an optimized uh, Monte Carlo simulation tool. And this was basically uh, made implementing um, some new two available parameterization that are based on measured data that have been obtained both at Los Alamos and PSIs in order to bypass actually the fact that Gen4 didn't have, let's say, the pineal production cross-section optimized for low energy. So the first step was uh, for us was actually to first validate the code and this was done uh, running Monte Carlo simulation and comparing it associated to let's say one or uh, several beam lines that we have at PSI this is just one when we could actually got a very good agreement between Monte Carlo simulation and uh, what we could measure so basically at that point we were ready to say that we could start to use let's say our um, gen 4 updated code in order to exploit the possibility of uh, this uh, HIMP uh, concept. And the initial idea was actually to try to get benefit from the neutron spallation uh, source. In fact, let's say what happens is that a large fraction of the beam goes through the two targets that I mentioned at the beginning, and then it's really stopped at the end. Let's say one megawatt of the 1.4 in total is in fact dumped on the CQ. And actually Monte Carlo simulation told us that um, 
Yes, you were right. We could have, let's say, up to 10 to 11 surface uh, muon beam, but in fact, in order to then extract the muons, here is just a picture of the structure of the um, spallation source. Here is the proton that coming in. In order the, uh, to extract then the muons which are produced at the CQ spallation in order to be efficient on this extraction and then the, the, the transmission, it was actually important to do important changes here at level of, uh, let's say, the SNQ structure itself. And what actually turned out is that due to the existing constraint associated with the SNQ, we could not get enough uh, captured muons for actually delivering a high intensity muon beam. So basically, this uh, forced us to do a, a step back and try to ask if there was basically room for improvement at the level of the uh, standard uh, muon production target and also at level of the uh, beam line itself. Here, just to tell you how the uh, current target E, which is the main immune production target we have at PSI, looks like. Here, let's say this uh, green uh, um, arrow show you, let's say, how the protons are impinging on the target. And here you can see, let's say, the secondary, uh, the secondary particle. And here are the characteristics of the target itself, which is rotating and actually that should also, let's say, dissipate quite a lot. Let's say energy deposit, which is equivalent to this uh, 50. A kilowatt. Okay, so then the point was to see if there was room for optimization at level of target, for example, thinking about different material and also different geometry at the level of the beam line, for example, trying to push for having higher capture efficiency for having a better uh, transport of the muons through the uh, beam line itself. And now, if you go back and remember that we are uh, talking about uh, a surface muon beam, which is basically the, the muons which are produced from, this, the, from the decay of the pions uh, along the skin of the target itself, we can immediately realize that if we want to increase the uh, muon yield, we should expect to increase, let's say, the uh, stop density of the uh, pion itself. Of course, the geometry of the target has also an impact because you want to have an extension of the target, uh, which is as much as possible in order to collect from the beamline side, let's say, the, the muons, but you should also allow the uh, muons to go to the target itself, because we are, let's say, interested in having this low energy muon beam, which means, let's say, that the momentum is uh, 28 MeV over C. And just to give you a reference, the range of such a muons is equivalent of one millimeter if we are talking about, for example, plastics. So then if we are going to do our exercise, what we are going to discover is that why, let's say, the pi yield increases as a function of Z, as soon as we should also consider the possibility of leaving the muons out from the target, what happens in practice is that the relative muon yield is going to follow, let's say, the red point that you can see on the plot. And that means that actually, let's say, the best choice for the target still remains low seed material, which means basically a graphite. Even if, let's say, we can consider the possibility of increasing a bit, for example, changing from graphite to a boron carbide. So the next step was actually to try to think if then, let's say, we could, let's say, improve it in terms of geometry itself. So the first simple exercise was just to have our target with the proton impinging on it and then increasing the length of the target and then prove that if you are going now to collect the muon from the side of the target itself, let's say the amount of muon yield is basically scaling uh, linearly, let's say, with the length itself. Of course, this is the easy thing. And uh, uh, what I mentioned at the beginning, this is a solution that we cannot apply straightforward because we have the constraint that uh, we should preserve uh, the beam characteristics after that the beam is impinging on our uh, immune surface target Get, we should preserve the beam characteristics for serving the um, neutron community for each reaching, let's say, the uh, neutron spallation source. So then the idea actually was try to think about, let's say, a solution that could keep the amount of material seen by the proton as was originally, but try to then increase the amount of surface that can be seen by the beam line when we are going to collect the muon itself. And we consider actually several 
several geometry internal actually the selected target would be the optimal choice for us uh, giving the possibility to increase it by one point uh, factor which is this 1.5 um, highlighted here. Now, as you can imagine, of course, let's say the amount of muon yield um, is a function of the target rotation angle. So this is how actually, let's say, the amount of muons is changing as a function of the target rotation angle, seeing the beam from the sideways backwards and forward. And our choice was actually to keep, let's say, the target rotation angle as a, at a small value in order to have the a three different, let's say, configuration similar in terms of relative yield. And then the next step was then actually, let's say, to, to build a new uh, target uh, with the goal of proof that uh, we could increase the surface muon rate for all connected beam lines that look at the target uh, with different angles and also increase the safety margin for missing target from the proton beam. And this you can figure out it immediately if you're going to compare, for example, the geometry of the new target, which is listed here, with the geometry of the old target which is basically uh, shown here. So what we did was then let's say uh, change the target E. This is the position of the target E along of the uh, beam, along of the proton beam line at PSI and here are basically the four uh, experimental areas that are looking let's say at this target and this was the expected enhancement in terms of uh, um, muon hill and what actually let's say we can tell you is that increased muon hill have been confirmed even if let's say the analysis is still ongoing. This is a solid uh, statement. And actually, let's say the, the current uh, target that we have at PSI is, let's say, this new target. And what we have to now confirm is the impact of higher thermal stress on, let's say, a long term um, stability. So in terms of the uh, experimental activities, uh, let's say the, uh, this the measurement of the uh, beam rate has been done uh, every time simultaneously by two independent detectors here, a, a detector based on acetylating fiber coupled to silicon photomultiplier, and here, let's say, what we call, let's say, pre-detector acetylator coupled, let's say, to a, a photomultiplier, and the two, let's say, detector actually gave us, let's say, a um, rate we, and the beam profile characteristics too, that were consistent at the level of the percentage. Then let's say the next step will be really now to move towards the high intensity neon beam project after that at least we got the confirmation of the increasing of the rate based on the target optimization only. And then the idea would be in this sense to actually to move from the position of the target E to the current position of the target M and to promote these two beam line here in the new, let's say, new high intensity neon beam line able to deliver up this to 10 to 10 uh, neons per second. Here, actually, how, let's say, the sketch of the new target look like. Let's say here is the original, let's say, make target, and this would be, let's say, the, the new one, the upgraded one, and also here, how, let's say, the two beam line would look like. Let's say we have the two, let's say, normal conducting radiation hard solenoid close to the target to capture the surface the surface muons and basically here you can see how the general beam line should look like. We are starting let's say from here and then we go through and then in order to deliver into the experimental area this 10 to 10 muons per second. Now the final beam optics is still under development nonetheless I can show you, let's say, how, let's say, the uh, uh, new uh, beam line, this pure solenoid beam line looks like uh, compared with the standard and the best beam line we actually have at PSI, which is a hybrid beam line, the new E4, let's say, beam line. And now you see that actually starting basically from the same amount of uh, a surface uh, muons available at the target level with an improved capture here. We are changing from six percentages to 26 percentages and then they improve the transmission from these seven percentages here to the 40 percentages here, we can actually end up with this 10 to 10 millions per, per second. Here, actually, there is a list of the things that, she'll, that still we have to do, let's say, from the uh, beam line itself, but uh, nonetheless, let's say, based on the uh, nice results that we got from the target side, we're 
quite confident that we would be able, let's say, to address all this uh, point in the uh, next year. So this basically brings me, let's say, to the uh, conclusion of the talk. Let's say, uh, and again, here I would like just to remind you that uh, the aim of the HIP project is to deliver this up to 10 to 10 minutes per second. Then the initial simulation show that the saturator are, are feasible. Actually, let's say the idea of this HIMP uh, project is based on the optimization of the target itself and the beam line. And uh, from the target side, let's say the new target has been successfully tested and the increase of the neural rate has been confirmed and to be consistent with what was expected. Now from the beam line point of view, let's say the beam optics are under development and probably the most important message I would like to share with you is that actually put into perspective the target optimization only, which correspond to this 50% increasing of, uh, of neons. This would correspond to effectively raising the proton beam power at PSI by this roughly 600 kilowatt. That would mean basically to change from 1.4 megawatt to two megawatt without the additional complications uh, such as, uh, let's say, increased energy radiation deposit into the target and its surrounding. And actually, if this would be confirmed also that from uh, we could get this 10 to 10 millions per second, and then if we repeat the same exercise, uh, putting into perspective the beam line optimization, this would be equivalent to a beam power of the order of several tens of megawatt. And then uh, based on that, let's say we are convinced that him would opened the door to actually interesting physics opportunity for particle physics, a child electron flavor violation experiment, and not only also experiment based on muons and also neonium and the material science. And basically this is all, and we would like to leave you with the final remark associated to the input that was submitted and recognized by the European Strategy Committee associated in particular here to the focus on the charge lipton flavor violation searches. Thank you very much. So thank you very much, Angela. And the questions? So I did not see any raised hand. Uh, any question from audience to Angela? Okay, so if not, uh, uh, so I would say uh, the recently uh, the muon collaboration is uh, is on the, is uh, on the way to to establish. So we received also the invitation to join. I mean, uh, from Daniel Schritt. So, uh, so the, the 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 muon. So any technology connected with muon beams and experiment and technologies, I think, is extremely important. So we are very pleased to hear the PISI uh, reports on these subjects. So thank you very much. Angela. Thank you very much. Yeah. So the next speaker from uh, Jay Park. From uh, uh, from uh, Tetsuro. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Oh, okay, so just a moment. So I'm sharing my slide. Okay. Yeah, we can see full screen. Oh, do you see? So we see, but uh, it's a two two page, a little bit small. <laughs> oh, sorry. Oh, just a moment. So, mm. so in your side, maybe only one page. Um. Sorry, how yeah. about this? Perfect. Oh, so okay. Let's go back to first page and uh, yeah, go ahead. Okay, so uh, first of all, so thank you very much for uh, giving me this opportunity. So I'm Tetsuro Sekiguchi from KKJ Park. 
So I'd like to report on the J-Park neutron beam upgrades towards 1.3 megawatt beam power for long baseline neutron oscillation experiments in Japan. So I'm reporting for J-Park neutron beam line group. So uh, this is the outline of my talks. So first, uh, I briefly overview of accelerator neutron beam. And then, so main topic is a uh, J-Park neutron beam line. So uh, current status and future upgrades. And uh, so uh, finally, so I, I uh, briefly report on the international cooperation high power neutron beam, and then summarize this talk. So uh, overview. So uh, accelerator-based neutron oscillation experiments are playing an important role in neutron physics since 1999. So uh, uh, recent T2K, so T2K is the Tokai to Kamioka long vessel neutron experiments. So uh, show the hint of large CP violation in neutron sector. So uh, we are producing a neutron, high intensity neutron beam at J Park and send to the beam to Kamioka direction, uh, middle, middle of Japan. And so uh, next generation experiments like uh, Hyper-K and Dune are aiming to reveal a uh, full picture of neutron oscillation with precise measurement of CP and uh, mixing parameters and also determinations mass ordering so those are uh, so no, unknown uh, in Newton physics. So uh, currently, sensitivity for CP variation is a two to three sigma level, but uh, uh, in future experiments, so we aim to achieve more than five sigma for discovery. Uh, so then, so we need uh, more than 10 times larger statistics so some current experiments. So uh, number of neutrino uh, uh, proportional to the uh, neutrino flux times uh, neutrino cross section times the uh, number of target nuclei in detector. So neutrino flux is uh, proportional to beam power. And also target number of target nuclei uh, is proportional to the detector volume. So uh, to achieve uh, larger statistics, so uh, we need uh, nearly 10 times larger new detectors and also uh, uh, more than one megawatt class beam power needed. So I briefly uh, show you the progress on the hyper Newton beam. So uh, the first long uh, Newton beam for the long baseline Newton physics is a uh, uh, K from neutron beam from uh, KEK 12 GBPS proton synchrotron for K2K experiments. So starting uh, 1999. So the uh, beam power was uh, six kilowatt. So this is the uh, first generation of the uh, so uh, long baseline neutron beam. So then, so from so. Uh, 20, uh, 2005, so new me beam and also Sun CNGS beam started. And also from uh, uh, so uh, 2010, so J Park Newton beam was also started. So, and also new me upgrade uh, with uh, 700 kilowatt. So, so uh, these are so, so called second generation uh, order of uh, 100 kilowatt beam. So, uh, so next step is, uh, so, uh, so beam power improvement towards uh, more than one megawatt. So, so called, so this is third generation of the Newton beam. Okay, so uh, I briefly uh, explained how to produce Newton beam. So we accelerate the proton beam. So in JPAC case, 30 GB proton beam hits the uh, graphite target. So, and then, so secondary pions are K ions are focused by magnetic horns and decay in, uh, into neutrinos of muons. So in the decay, decay volume. So, uh, so positively charged pion can decay to uh, muon neutrino uh, while the, uh, so negatively charged pion 
can decay to uh, anti muon neutron beam. So we can select uh, neutron sign of neutron beam by flipping the home polarity. So then, so all the hadrons are uh, absorbed by beam dump, and just behind the beam dump, so high energy muons are uh, monitored uh, by muon monitors. So uh, this is bird's eye view of J Park. So J Park uh, consists of the uh, three accelerators. So one is uh, so 400 MeV Linac and uh, 3GB rapid cycling synchrotron, RCS, and 30 GB main ring synchrotron. So, and we also have uh, three experimental facilities. So, so one from uh, RCS, so we, we have, uh, uh, we use a uh, 3GB proton beam for the material and life science. And uh, uh, from 30GB uh, mending, so we use a uh, proton beam for a uh, neutron experimental facility. And also there is uh, another, so the hadron experimental has facility. So uh, this is a, a schematic view of the neutron beam line. So accelerated 30 GB proton beam is extracted inward to the neutron beam line. So primary, neutron, uh, primary proton beam line consists of the uh, first straight section and the uh, final straight section and also uh, arc section. So equipped with uh, so superconducting uh, uh, magnets. And here is a, a target station. So include, includes, which includes a target and magnetic horns and 100 meter long decay volume and also beam dump. And uh, there is a, a neutron near detector, uh, near detector located at uh, 200, 280 meter away from the target. So to monitor the uh, neutron beam. So uh, this is the status of uh, j Park neutron beam. So uh, we started physics data taking in January 20, uh, 2010. So then, so uh, this uh, horizontal axis shows the time and the vertical axis shows the uh, accumulated uh, number of protons uh, on the target. So, uh, so blue line shows the uh, accumulated uh, POT. So, and uh, so dot shows uh, uh, achieved beam power. So, and the pink band shows uh, uh, beam time. So, for each year. So, and we, uh, uh, so far, so we achieved uh, 550, uh, so 15 kilowatts stable operation with a uh, 2.66 uh, times uh, 10 to the 14 protons per pulse. So this is the uh, world highest intensity in fast extracted beam from proton synchrotron. So, uh, but uh, beam power is limited by space charge effect and also beam instability due to insufficient R voltage. So which needs uh, improvements. So for T2K data taking, so uh, this main link provided uh, 3.64 times 10 to the 20 fast protons on target so far. So uh, almost so 55% uh, neutron beam and also 45% uh, anti-neutron beam. So this is status. Okay, so let's move to the j -Park upgrade toward 1.3 megawatt. So, uh, so we uh, will have a staged accelerator upgrade toward 1.3 megawatts. So uh, there are two ways to increase uh, uh, beam power. So one thing is uh, to achieve a shorter cycle, so current uh, cycle is a 2.48 second, so which is uh, should, uh, will be uh, reduced to the 1.32 second to achieve a uh, design power of 750 kilowatt. So this will be done to 2021. 
So, and also uh, uh, another thing is uh, increasing uh, uh, beam intensity. So to achieve higher beam power. So, and uh, this uh, bottom table shows uh, current and uh, upgrade. So beam power and intensity and cycle. So currently 0.5 megawatt. So uh, with uh, this number. So and uh, so for the upgraded uh, scenario. So we increase the uh, proton intensity to 3.2 times 10 to the 14 uh, protons per pulse. And finally, reducing to the 1.16 second cycle. So uh, this bottom right uh, plot shows the uh, uh, expected uh, beam power as a function of time. So first upgrade will be done in 2021. So by uh, replacing the uh, main ring magnet power supply. And then, so after that, so we increase, uh, gradually increase the beam power. So by upgrading the RF system. So final goal is 1.3 megawatt. So to be achieved around 2028. So uh, this is a scenario for the accelerator upgrade. And for the Newton beam line, so we also need uh, uh, so significant, significant upgrade. So I will uh, explain uh, from now. On. So uh, so basic design of the JPAC Newton beam line is uh, so uh, so design beam power is uh, 750 kilowatts with 3.3 uh, times 10 to the 14th proton per pulse. So and uh, for a replaceable components like uh, horns and target, so designed for 750 kilowatt. But uh, non-replaceable component like uh, so the helium vessel, decay volume, and the beam dump, so were uh, designed for the three to four megawatts. So, so uh, necessity necessity upgrade uh, towards one point three megawatt is uh, so yeah improving uh, cooling capacity to remove the higher heat generated by higher beam power beam uh, higher power beam. So this includes a uh, uh, target rim cooling and water cooling for horn herring vessel and so on. And uh, so uh, another upgrade is uh, uh, to accommodate the shorter cycle operation, uh, which includes a uh, horn operation and the DAQ. And uh, from the high power beam, so uh, large amount of radioactivity uh, will be produced. So uh, we upgrade the radioactive waste disposal facility. So especially for the uh, radioactive water. And uh, for the uh, hyper beam, so safe and reliable control is necessary. So we are improving the control system and beam monitors. So uh, one example is the target upgrade. So original target uh, design is uh, uh, to survive a thermal shock by 3.3 times 10 to the 14 protons per pulse. So uh, this value, so uh, 3.2 times 10 to the 14 should be okay. So, but the uh, cooling capacity is uh, only 900 kilowatts. So we need improvement. So, so to achieve, uh, yeah, uh, so we, uh, so, we will achieve the higher heading flow rate. So to improve cooling performance. So, and uh, in this case, so higher pressure uh, heading gas flow is needed. So from uh, currently 1.6 bar to five bar. So to achieve a double flow rate. So, uh, and so heading compressor system should be upgraded. So uh, we perform the thermal simulation for 1.3 megawatt case. So, and expected temperature of the target core is uh, 900 uh, degrees C. So, so we, uh, so we further optimize uh, this design. 
And uh, for phenyl circulation line, so vacuum insulation pipes uh, now developed for the higher temperature heading flow. And uh, also uh, prototyping the new target with the high pressure tolerance is ongoing. So, and helium circulation system and, uh, will be upgraded. So in fiscal year 2025. So for home, so uh, home electrical system uh, will be upgraded. So for 320 kilograms operation at one hertz. So uh, original design of the home current is a 320 kilograms, but uh, uh, we are now operating at uh, 250 grams due to the, some uh, power supply problems. So, and uh, uh, so by achieving a higher current, so uh, we, we can gain the 10% Newton flux, and also we, uh, we can reduce uh, uh, five to 10% flux reduction for the long sign Newton background. So uh, we developed a new power supply and new transformer. So this is the current configuration. So for three horns, so we have now two power supply systems. So uh, one power supply for one horn and one power supply for uh, so two horns in series. So uh, we will uh, increase the number of power supplies. So, and uh, so first, so we will achieve a one hertz operation. So after, so after 2022 and uh, later, so 320 kilos operation uh, will be achieved by adding uh, another power supply. So we are also uh, upgrading a uh, uh, home conductor cooling. So, and uh, uh, by adapting a water cooler slip line so water tube is embedded in this uh, aluminum plates. So uh, this shows a uh, temperature simulation, which uh, shows a reasonable temperature at, even at a higher wind power. So we also need uh, other upgrade items. So uh, radioactive water disposal. Uh, so, <coughs> so this, uh, Current limitation is the uh, size of the dilution tank. So uh, we will uh, construct a new dilution tank with larger size. So, and now, so new building is cons uh, being constructed here. So, and also cooling capacity should be improved. So current capacity is one megawatt, but uh, we will need uh, improvement. And also, so for beam monitors, so new beam profile monitors are developed for high intensity uh, beam. So uh, this is, is a schematic uh, uh, picture of the new beam monitor. So we inject a very so uh, a nitrogen gas in, into the beam vacuum, beam vacuum pipe, and by so beam is intercepting this. Uh, uh, gas and that creates a fluorescent light, which can be uh, detected by a photon detector. So we uh, perform the first uh, beam test, uh, and we observe the signals. So which is a reasonable result. And also a control DAQ system will be upgraded for uh, one hertz operation. Okay, so this is uh, timeline. So so. One health operation will be uh, done. So uh, after so long shutdown in uh, 2021 to 2022, and also radioactive water disposal will be upgraded. And another uh, upgrade period is uh, so uh, around 2025. So which includes a uh, water cooling upgrade and target upgrade. So, but uh, for the later upgrade, so this uh, ins in in installation plan is uh, still under discussion. So we aim to uh, perform the uh, this upgrade in uh, so in so 2024 or uh, earlier. Uh, so finally, so uh, I briefly mentioned about the international cooperation of the hyper beam, Newton beam. 
So, uh, so there were uh, three uh, uh, major accelerators. So in uh, Asia and uh, North America and uh, Europe, and uh, uh, so three Newton beam lines. So and the so good it relationship. So uh, yeah. Uh, oh, yeah. This is for time and uh, you almost you stop. Uh, so please be okay. a little bit quick. Yeah. Okay. So uh, yeah. So uh, so I would, I want to say about the uh, high intensity uh, Newton beam cannot be uh, produced uh, only by uh, single institutes. So uh, uh, many so uh, inter collaboration so cooperation is needed. So but uh, we. Uh, now, so doing the uh, co cooperative uh, so research. Okay, so uh, let's summarize. But uh, yeah, uh, I will skip. So that's all. Yeah, thank you uh, very much uh, for this tutorial uh, for this. Uh, uh, important talk of uh, high power uh, beam. Uh, questions from audience? May I make a, a, a naive question perhaps? Because it's, it's really amazing this, um, yeah, all this architecture to get these, these neutrino beams, but obviously you're always producing a muon beam at the muons, but those muons where they are just dumped and, and let's say wasted or are they used uh, for any <coughs> other purposes? Yeah, because so we had discussed basically... before about the muons. So muons uh, are yeah, almost uh, dumped, but uh, uh, we are using this uh, muons, so tertiary muons, for the uh, to monitor the uh, so uh, beam. Yeah, this is how I understood it. But is it is there no not any physics use for these muons? Is, are they useless, or can we do some? Could we do some physics also? Yeah, I'm just thinking about the very nice talk by Angela. But uh, yeah, so uh, this, <laughs> nice muons. this is a very broad muon beam. So <laughs> I think for physics experiments, uh, it's hard. But uh, yeah, so uh, by using the, these muons, so we are now developing many monitors. So at uh, this muon pit, muon monitor pit. So okay, so. So due to the time limitation, so we, we will stop here. So thanks again, uh, Tetsuro. And thank you, thank very much. you uh, all the uh, speakers in the first block. And uh, we will go back uh, 25 minutes later. And uh, uh, in the next block, we will have uh, our CERN for analog, uh, AWAKE, XFEL, and uh, ALIMA, and MDI. So please uh, be... Uh, sure to come back to join the session. Thank you. See you. Hello, everybody. This is Daniele Margarone speaking. Uh, I will take over the next uh, block. So for the speakers who are still uh, here, we can use this time to check Technically, if everything works. For Hi. You. Ciao, Daniele. Ciao. I will also put my video on. Yes. Okay. So, Alfredo, I can see you. So, if you can uh, start. Uh, so, I, I, I'll I share the screen. Right? I can see you. You can share the screen now, please. I share the screen with you. And I'd like to go straight on the. Okay. This is my talk. So I sh should I put a full screen for you? I don't see I don't see the, your screen at all at the moment actually. Ah, okay, very good. Only your uh, video. I push the button, share the screen. I just push the button, and I got into 
Zoom. I just see uh, Zoom. I think uh, once you push the button, you should see different uh, windows and you should choose the one you want to share. Uh, uh, okay. Windows. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> In, uh, ah, okay. I see many windows. I see. Yeah. Okay. And I, I push on the on one with my, yeah. my presentation. Yes. I, now I can see. Can you try the full screen, please? I'll go full screen on, on the presentation. That's it. Right? Perfect. Uh, can you move one slide? Yes, fine. I can also see your um, um, cursor, so you can also move the, the cursor if you want to indicate something. Perfect. Thank you. Great. So it works. Okay. So uh, so you you'll be introducing me like a standard. Yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah. Yes. Yes. Yes, yes. Okay. I will say a few okay, words good. at the beginning. So if you can uh, uh, stop sharing, we will check the next uh, speaker. I will do that now. I ask from here. I go to Zoom. Uh, the, the next I, I stop sharing. Okay. Perfect. Thank you. Thank you. You can. Uh, Thank you, Daniele. Thank you. you can stop your video and uh, mute uh, your microphone. Uh, also. Thank you. Next uh, speaker is, um, uh, is a jo uh, or next test will be done with uh, Giovanni Zevi della Porta. Is... Hello, that's me. Can you see me and hear me? Yes. Ciao. Okay. Ciao. Let me uh, share. Um, what I want to show. Um, yes, you I see, can see it. And then yes. I move, I go here. Oops. And I move slides. Perfect, perfect. I see everything, the arrow, everything. Okay, very good. I can hear you well. Thanks. All right, thanks, bud. Good luck. <laughs> see you in a bit. Okay, then uh, let me also ask uh, Alexander Morodocense if uh, he is uh, there to test his uh, presentation probably is not there yet so let's try with francesco schillaci uh, yeah i'm here um, yeah. uh, try the, if you can if you can try also the video if you want to share the video yes can, can you see okay so i will try to share my presentation is it visible uh, coming, yes, and uh, uh, move uh, one slide, please. On, perfect. Okay, I can see your hand also. Perfect. Okay, Very so I'm stopping the sharing. Yes, you have time for coffee. And cigarette. <laughs> okay, next, uh, uh, Lori ne Neve. Sorry for the pronunciation. You should tell me. Hello, um, yeah, Lori Nibi. Uh, okay. Yeah. Nice Thanks very much. Um, <laughs> okay. So hopefully, yeah, you can see. Um, so you, can you see the slides? Yes, perfectly. Uh, and, okay. Yep. Um, perfect. Fine. I can I can see also your the the cursor, so you can use it during the presentation. Okay. Perfect. Perfect. Thank you very much. See you soon. See you soon. Thanks. And uh, uh, and uh, uh, again, I apologize for the pronunciation. How are you, she? Are you there? Not yet. So, Alexander Molodoshense, uh, are you there? Not yet. Okay, I think they will come in a few. Actually, I ah. already tested the presentation in the beginning of the previous session. Ah, okay. Only, only, Alexander, only, only Alexander is missing. Thank you. Thanks. By the way, I'm Peter and I am your Zoom assistant. So if you need ah. something, I'm here. Uh, very good. Thank you very much. Uh, 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 just, uh, Peter, just to confirm, uh, uh, before we start, I uh, will have the right also to mute uh, speakers in case there is uh, someone. You have them already. Oh, thank you. Great. Yes. So if everything is tested, I will put the waiting screen. Uh, no, 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 it's not everything tested. We are missing uh, Alexander Molodozhansev, uh, one talk, 1001. So please wait. Okay. You, I think you said that uh, Dr. Xi has tested before earlier, right? Yeah. Yes, exactly. Yeah. So only one we are missing. I will uh, actually 
I I can uh, try to reach him in person because we are in the same in the same building. <laughs> Alexander Molodogenfe, are you there? Okay, not yet. Yes, Alexander, I can see you now. Perfect. Hello. <laughs> I will I will be connected here from my from my office because yeah. I have everything uh, here. So I, will, I will try to share the screen. Just uh, yes, please. So screen share. So do you see share the presentation, please. Not the not your personal email. <laughs> That's not <myself. laughs> okay. Okay. Do you see that? Yes, yes. Uh, can you go um, full screen or presentation mode? Yes. yes. Very good. I can see. And the one slide uh, change, like next slide, please. Can we have, uh, okay, yes. Can you? Yeah, perfect. It works. Thank you, Alexander. Yeah. Okay, so stop uh, sharing video, everything, and uh, we, right? Yeah. So what I can see that uh, I need to enter uh, using my also family name because I just put Alexander. There's two common. Yeah. No, it's okay. It's okay. It's I will. I will introduce you. So don't worry. I can rename easy. Okay. I'll yeah. rename. So. One moment. Ah, yeah. perfect. Very good. Thank you. Thank you. So you can stop sharing the video for now. Yes. Okay. So uh, and leave. I will yeah. leave the room. Okay. No, 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 don't leave the if you want the, I think stay uh, online but ah. stop video. Okay. We'll use the same as let's say room for me. Yes, yes. Stay, stay there. Stop video and, and mute your uh, microphone, or I can mute it. Okay. Perfect. Thank you. Uh, so, Peter, I think we checked everything. So, if you want to put uh, uh, another screen, you are free to do that. Um, see you in a few minutes. Okay, great, thank you.
Okay. Hello, everybody. So since we have a few minutes before the recording will start, I would like to use this time to, to remind you a few technical uh, details. So the audience, both speakers and participants should mute themselves unless they're speaking, of, co of course. Uh, and uh, participants uh, should say their name before they ask a question. And uh, the alternative, they can post uh, questions in the chat box, but this is not preferable because it will make some noise. So please raise, raise your hand and then I will, uh, I will uh, ask you to, to, uh, to, to, to speak. Uh, yeah, I would like to remind all the speakers that they have, they have in total 20 minutes, uh, but in fact, 15 minutes for the talk and five minutes for the for questions, so please try to fit within 15 minutes, and we can uh, use uh, plenty of we, then we can have plenty of time for several questions. Uh, in case there will be too many questions, uh, I would like to remind you that the session or the will be will keep will stay open one more hour at the at the end. So please stay, and uh, you can use this uh, time to have uh, additional questions. Uh, uh, then, uh, yeah, the speakers, it is recommended the speaker will have their video on, but this is not mandatory, so I leave it uh, to you. It would be nice in the virtual conference to see each other, but if not, uh, a must. And I think that's, uh, that's it. So probably Peter will start uh, recording. Uh, Peter, may I ask you if I should uh, record myself in mm. the computer? I will do it. Okay. Just I will switch it on just now. Thank you. <clears throat> okay, so two more minutes and we will uh, start the block, the last block. Okay, and welcome again. Uh, my name is Daniele Margarone from Eli Beamlines, uh, Institute of Physics of the Czech Academy of Science here in Prague. And uh, I would like to, to introduce the last but not least uh, block of the, our parallel session on accelerator. So to, uh, during this block, uh, the main focus will be on emerging compact uh, acceleration schemes and technologies, along with powerful uh, numerical simulation tools, and also including an uh, exotic introductory talk on the need of a CERN for analogs by Alfredo Iorio. Uh, well, I think uh, this is uh, will, it's a quite, those are quite interesting topics. So I expect from the audience a lot of questions. Uh, so now I will uh, leave the floor to uh, Professor Iorio from uh, Charles University, Prague. Uh, please. Thank you very much, Daniele, for the introduction. And uh, here uh, is my technical skills. Let's see if I get, if I understood everything. Can you see everything? Hello? 
Uh, not yet, only your video at the moment. Only myself. Yeah. Okay, so I have to go on Zoom. This is where I see I see the uh, transparencies, right? This is my slides. Now you should see it. Yes, yes, okay. If you okay. Can, then you can start. And I make I make full screen. Let's see. Okay. Is it, Very good. Is it okay like that? You see what I see probably. Yes, yes, fine. Okay, so it is indeed um, uh, a pleasure and, uh, and a challenge for me to be here. I actually choose to be here. And I was asked to be in the formal theory, but I said, no, 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 I want to be here because um, uh, I want to foster this idea of a construction, actual construction of a facility where we can test new physics by using analogs. Uh, let me go, I have 15 minutes altogether, so I have to rush. Uh, so what, what, what I uh, call here Helios is, is a name that is a long while now, it's about three, four years, it goes among our collaborators to indicate this facility. This thing at the moment is a sort of an ideal place. And uh, we use this acronym Helios, which uh, as you know, is, uh, is uh, the god of, of the sun in Greek. That stands for High Energy Laboratory for Indirect Observations. Uh, the plan of the talk is the following. I will just uh, briefly say what, well, everything will be brief. So I will tell about uh, the work of our group and how essentially this idea came about uh, and the importance of analogs and why analogs are good to probe new physics. Okay, and then I'll try to focus on, on Helios in particular for the scientific goals and the practical issues. Okay, so uh, our group at Charles University uh, is focusing on a, a specific uh, um, analog, which is essentially, uh, uh, I may say, is our invention in the sense that it's a material which is super well known. And it's, of course, the credits for the discovery of the material goes to uh, Andre Garme and Costa Novoselov. But what we, what we have done over the years, and I'll, I'll show you a list of, of papers in a moment, was essentially uh, to understand how to uh, uh, manipulate this material to simulate uh, let me say, situation that we should encounter uh, near black holes or near what people call quantum gravity scenarios. Okay, the group I'm talking about these days is quite populated. Uh, these are two uh, postdocs. This is my, my, my closest collaborators, Pablo Pais, who's now a senior postdoc in Chile. This is our uh, recent, uh, most recent acquisition and a student. And uh, probably some of you will recognize people from, from the um, that's been uh, employed here at, at the laser facility there in Prague, okay, and, and all the people that collaborated over the years. Uh, and unfortunately, um, kind of recently, uh, this young collaborator left us. Uh, in any case, uh, this is the group. So it is a very active group. The work initiated uh, with these papers here in, in 2010, 2011, where we have realized that uh, graphene can be a, a very fruitful um, uh, place where to test these fundamental ideas, okay? And then he went on and on, and you see here, you, you, you will record, we will record this, uh, this uh, lecture, so you will probably have time to go through it if you want, and there are many, many papers. You see that uh, the, 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 the number of papers of the last year uh, is, is growing kind of uh, exponentially, so there is a lot of activity. In this, in this area. But uh, uh, this is why essentially I qualify, and I think, I hope to qualify to say a word about this, uh, this idea of, of Helios. Okay, there are of course many other uh, analogs. And let me now uh, move to the next um, topic, I mean, the next part of my talk, which is why analogs are important to probe new physics. Okay, so besides the wonderful machines that you'll be talking about, you have been talking about in the section, in other section in this beautiful conference, I, uh, I uh, humbly ask uh, the community to think about considering also this uh, uh, very, uh, say, le much less costly facility where we can try to probe new physics. But why is this interesting? Well, I have to still make the case because this is somehow still at the pay the case. And you saw uh, Richard Feynman in the, in the introduction here because it was you can take the, 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 the road from very far away. You can go back to Kepler. But I, I like to take Richard Feynman as the um, contemporary father of this line of research. Uh, essentially, we are um, accustomed to use uh, these three members of this family in our analysis of, of, 
of, uh, of physics, okay, now we're understanding of physics, which is symmetry, duality, and correspondence. Okay, symmetry, you make a transformation, you, you send your fields to a set of new fields, the action does not change, this is a symmetry, and we know everything about it. Okay, spontaneous symmetry, brick, the Higgs mechanism, and so on and so forth. Duality is a sort of newer idea, but not that new anyway, uh, where you send uh, fields into dual, but you don't get back the same action, but you get a dual action, and we know how to deal with that. And in, the, in this area, uh, the famous now very well-known idea of ADS-CFT correspondence was born. So we are accustomed to that. What we are less accustomed, at least in the, in the world of, uh, of pure high energy physics, is the fact that uh, sometimes equations present a very common structure, which is what we call analogy. And the, the no, no underlying structure is considered. So uh, Feynman was uh, in, in a famous lecture uh, that I will cite in a moment, uh, realize that, okay? And, and looking at, the, at, the, at this equation, this very same equation up here, which is the equation for, for electrostatics, okay? He realized that the same equation holds for, uh, uh, for other uh, systems. The flow heat, the stretching membrane, the fusion neutrons, irrotational flows, the illumination of plane, and probably you can keep going, okay? And he says this beautiful word, so whatever we know about electrostatics can immediately be carried over into that other subject and vice versa. Okay, so we know about one and we extend this knowledge to the others. In this case, uh, the, the list of others is, is here. Okay, but then he went on, okay, and he said, he said why is this happening? Well, why the, the equation for different phenomena are so similar? You know, the Feynman has this beautiful power of imagination that can bring him very far away by using simple considerations. And by using the simple consideration, he came up with this idea that everything there was similar because way of simplifying things, he called axons. So he said there must be that some, the real world consists of this little accent, this fundamental object, okay, that uh, can only be seen at the very tiny distances. Why I say that? Well, because then much, much later, forefront research, which is a quantum gravity we really want to probe and where we expect an, an enormous amount of new physics, came up with similar ideas by looking at uh, that black hole physics here. You see the famous Bekenstein bound that says that, that the, the entropy of any material system must be bounded from above by the, the entropy of a black hole, okay? Led Bekenstein and then all the, all the family of quantum gravity people to, the, um, to positing the existence of a level X, okay? So actually, by, by the way, they use very similar wording. So uh, the idea in, 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 in images is that uh, it's not just that all these uh, five cases that, uh, um, that Feynman considered were uh, analog to electrostatics, but that electrostatic itself, along with all of them, is, uh, is, uh, is pointing to something which is in common, okay? So this is something we want to, we want to bring from this general idea of, of, uh, of, the, of why analog systems are important to probe fundamental physics already at the level we're talking about. If you want some further readings, I, 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 I really uh, suggest to read the famous lecture by Feynman uh, in, in, in his, it is the, 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 it's the, the, the book we all know about, okay? The Feynman Lectures and Physics, volume two, chapter 12, which is called Electrostatic Analog. Everyone knows, well, or should know, at least the famous sentence, uh, same equation, same solution, but this is just the beginning of the chapter. Please go through all of it and you will, you will be amazed. You may agree or not, but it's a different topic. And then I, I suggest some further reading by Jakob Bekenstein, uh, a paper that I wrote on those philosophical issues, let's say, and then a, a paper written by a philosopher, uh, essentially that it, is taking my, my, my things here, is enlarging uh, the, the, the philosophical analysis and pointing to, to, to the necessity of looking for the fundamental things. So why Helios? Well, Helios, I said what I meant, what I mean by Helios, and why I, 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 I dared to be among you, uh, I could say the real physicists, those who, who actually put their hands in the things, okay, I'm the theoretical guy here, but I like to talk very much, as, as um, some of you in the audience know, to experimentalists, and, uh, and I think that really, uh, I, I would like to make the case for this facility somehow. Uh, so, I say that uh, the goals here are uh, uh, the scientific goals that you see here. It's the second scientific goals are of three kinds. Okay, to find accents. I mean, what I say by this sentence, you see, is under quotation. I mean that we can look for the fundamental guys. So for the very new physics, even at this level of energy, we don't need to go. Uh, of course, it would be great if you had an accelerator of the size of the galaxy. We can actually probe uh, certain 
energies where well, we cannot okay so we have to uh, we, we have to be content with the fact that this thing can be in principle done but we still have to do some theoretical work on that and we have to systematize this thing and here i cite a beautiful work of my former supervisor my PhD supervisor which is the late Lachlan Rifati, who uh, was, uh, he's been among the inventors of supersymmetry, so a very, a very theoretical person, but he, he, he didn't, he didn't um, let me say, he, he likes these things of, of, of the analogs, and he found a duality transformation that would connect supernova explosions, uh, supernova, the real supernovas up there, with the implosions in, in plasma in, 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 uh, under intense lasers, okay? So he found a precise connection in that, and then all, all the physics that, most of the physics that you could see from the plasma uh, under intense laser will be translated under this duality to the physical supernova. So this stuff is to say that one of the goals of this uh, of this place, scientific goals, would be to actually look for the fundamental guys and systematize and put analogs in the right place in this family of 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 uh, uh, well-known theoretical tools like symmetry, duality, and correspondence. A second thing which is somehow more practical and still very fundamental, is to focus on very important debates, uh, open issues. Okay, one of the open, the most, as, as you probably all know, uh, one of the most important issues open out there is the, uh, the, 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 the uh, occurrence or not of information loss in black hole physics. Okay, you know that this, the history is, is super long, but it can never be closed because there is no experimental evidence. Okay, here I summarize this by this picture, which is a famous page carve of the, of the evaporation of a black hole. And here the question mark is, if this carve, which is the, the, how the entanglement entropy evolves in time, ends up to zero, there will be no information loss. If it ends up somewhere up here, there will be information loss. Can we envisage experiments? Okay, can we move from the kinematics of, of a Hawking phenomenon, uh, which is a kinematical phenomenon on a black hole, to a dynamical. So this is another challenge that, that Helios should, should face. And three is a sort of a didactical. So I'm also teaching sometimes. So I, 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 I became aware of the importance of, of, of saying things properly to the students. And I think that, um, uh, that uh, those young guys who went into pure theory these days are missing the idea that, of what, that, that what they say can be tested in experiments. Okay. Of course, if you talk, if you if you work on supersymmetry strings, uh, loop quantum gravity, and all this business, let me say, you grow up with the idea that your stuff could never be tested. Well, I think this is not true. In Helios, you could do that. Okay. You can invent always. You can always find an analog where some part of what you say can be seen experimentally. Okay. And actually, here I I I, I put this very famous equation of the so-called Virasoro algebra that for. For those who are not aware of that, this is a very fundamental object that is found in many places, which I cite over here. Yeah. Well, uh, it can be. We can find actual shapes in, uh, that we can make in a lab. Okay. Uh, so. I read here that the connection is not stable. Hope you can still hear me. Now the practical issues. The practical issue on why Helios is important. Well, we would have really a, a, a cross-fertilization place at work because we would have condenser matter people, high energy physicists, all together, all working towards this goal. And you never know what's going, what can come up. Okay, You would like to make a black hole, but you, while you're trying to make a black hole with graphene, you may end up doing a device. Okay. Uh, and it would be a wonderful place. It would be a wonderful place because if you have a theoretical idea, you can go straight to the experimentalist and ask him, ask or ask her to, 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 to do it. You will learn. It would be a, a, a fantastic place for cross fertilization. And I say, you know, borders are all, all, the borders will be all removed. Okay. Uh, in my personal opinion, uh, this is something that could be built in the, in the same spirit of, of how the ICTP of, of Abdul Salam. Was started. I have also practically, uh, okay, this is my own, um, let me say, in, uh, uh, wish, but uh, uh, there is also a practical story here. It's the fact that since it will not need a titanic technological uh, effort to be done, okay, this is something that could be done in, in uh, also in non super developed places, okay. In, at the end of the day, we have to put nest to, to theorists uh, some condensed matter facility, which usually is, is much less costly than, than other facility. And about costs, let me now just give you uh, the last sentence. I hope I, I may manage to stay the, within the 15 minutes. This is a, um, a, 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 a transparency, a slide that was given to me by friends working in CERN. 
and this is the budget of CERN, which is, of course, all well deserved. Okay, but let me say that uh, for a start, of what we're thinking, I didn't do a proper calculation, but we will be super happy if we get this uh, tiny fraction of the of the nineteen. Oh, excuse me, the 2012-18 budget, okay? This 33 million will be super, super good for, for starting our Helios, and it will be just a tiny fraction of um, what, what CERN is actually um, using for, for, for its running, its standard running. And okay, that's it. So uh, I can close here, and I'm, I'm, I'm ready for, for questions. Unfortunately, I will not be able to stay uh, after my talk, uh, uh, but so if you have questions i'd like to i'd like to take them uh, right now thank you very thank much you. thank you very much alfredo a interesting futuristic talk i hope it will be in a close future okay so the session is open for questions i do not see any hand raised yet so maybe i will start you, you and then you will have one more minute or uh, to think about uh, your question uh, uh, Alfredo, you mentioned your super, the sentence from your supervisor about lasers and plasmas. As you know, I am a poor experimentalist, so I will ask you an experimental question. Did you um, do you have a, do you have already an estimation or rough estimation of the laser intensity and plasma temperature that you would need uh, to do something which is already interesting for analogs? Okay, so in the, um, okay, for this particular case, uh, I, 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 have, uh, I have no uh, idea. <laughs> I just remember this happened in 2001, and as you may see from here, where I was uh, still studying uh, with O'Reilly. What I know of this particular situation is that these people were uh, measuring uh, some certain transitions with, uh, with um, like critical exponents, and they were measuring this critical exponent of this phase transition and had no idea why the critical exponent came up that number. I don't know, two thirds or three fourths, I can't remember. And by using this duality that they found in there, uh, they actually were able to predict precisely this, this number. So that's why I cited this as a case where a very precise theoretical argument can set up a, a, a super precise correspondence. As um, for your question about uh, the specific, uh, let me say, uh, the specific uh, characteristics of the lasers to, 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 to build something useful for analogs, as you might, so perhaps you might remember, we've been interacting with uh, Tazio Levato, Marcelo Ciappina, and other people there from LA Beamline. And our, our um, understanding, we have now uh, recently published a, a physical review on, on, on the topic, and what we have understood in that case, is that more than the power itself, what is very important is to have a high control on the, on the, on the harmonics. Okay, so these days, there is a lot of uh, study on how the laser uh, interaction with the graphene, actually the, the graphene itself, can generate uh, high harmonics. Uh, and this is super important for us because, as, as, as you know, the generation of high harmonics goes into the nonlinear regime very much. Okay, and these will um, will um, essentially select, find the window of where to uh, to look for for the analogs. Uh, so, uh, to to answer your question, uh, we don't focus very much on the intensity, but rather on the frequency part. And the, the good news for, for for people like me is that there is a high control of this uh, of this. Um, uh, Intense, excuse me, these frequencies, and this is super important. Let me let me give an example. Let's see. I don't have. I have. A, I have very little equations here. I don't know if I have anything. No, I don't have anything in here. I don't. I don't want to go into the computer and show. Okay. You. okay. okay. So you can think. You can think of this fact. Okay. What I need. What I need. Uh, if I need something that simulates a gravitational field, but it's not a gravitational field. So if you want to do that, then I mean, you need a potential. Because if, when you write general relativity, we all know it's, it's, a, it's a curvature of space-time. But curvature of space-time, the most important bit is the time part, the G00. So the clock that goes with frequencies that you can tune. Well, if we can do that, we can really, uh, let me say, that we can, we can really have a control on how this laser will simulate the gravitational field. So this is the... Uh, more than the intensity, that's, this is where we're pointing. And if, if we're able to do that, we will have a very nice uh, device to simulating essentially any kind of gravitational field. Okay. 
Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, we have time for one short question. If not, let me thank the speaker again, and uh, we can move thank to you. the next uh, speaker. So Giovanni Zevi della Porta, he will be reporting on uh, highlights on, of the AWAKE experiment. Uh, Alfredo, if you can please stop your video. Uh, I, mm, very good, thank you. Giovanni. Hello, can you hear me and see me? Yes, now yes, okay. And my slides are okay? Uh, it looks perfect. Go, All right. Um, so, hello and uh, thanks for uh, inviting me and in, uh, awake uh, to present our uh, recent uh, recent results and future plans uh, we're very happy to be here uh, even if it's virtual um, I will start by uh, introducing what the principle behind awake is um, then I'll show you the most important results of our first run uh, this is all uh, quite recent um, what we are preparing for our next run uh, and then what we're thinking about uh, to go beyond. So the principle behind the wake uh, is uh, plasma wake field acceleration using a proton driver. Um, and this requires several steps. Uh, so I'm going to try to go through them uh, in this cartoon. First of all, uh, we use a laser pulse, which is red here to ionize a gas forming a plasma. Then a proton bunch, which is our, our driver, uh, generates wave fields in the plasma at the plasma resonant frequency. And because the plasma resonant frequency, the plasma wavelength is smaller than the proton bunch, then micro bunches are formed. Essentially, the, the structure of the proton bunch changes. Uh, and then these micro bunches act coherently to generate wave fields. Uh, and if uh, we put electrons in these wave fields, the electrons are accelerated and also focused. So this is what we're trying to do and what we're trying to prove uh, that is possible. Uh, now, why do we want to do this? So uh, these are uh, the two most important questions uh, uh, that, that, that we want to, uh, that motivate our experiment or why do we use uh, plasma instead of a superconducting RF cavity? This is true for all uh, wake field acceleration. The idea is that plasma can sustain higher fields, so more megavolts per meter. Uh, leading to shorter and therefore hopefully cheaper accelerators. Uh, and then a nice property is that plasma is actually self-focusing. So uh, it provides uh, not just accelerating, but also focusing fields. Um, then why do we want to use protons? Awake is the only uh, plasma wave field accelerator, accelerator that tries to use protons. And the idea here is that protons are the beams with the highest stored energy per bunch currently available. Uh, so, uh, of course, uh, if, and, and, you know, and they are already available at uh, several facilities, mostly CERN, uh, but not only. And so if we can use uh, existing proton beams to reach the energy frontiers with electrons, uh, it's, it's, it's a win-win. We don't have to build uh, the, the driver accelerator. And we also don't have to uh, use staging of several small uh, steps uh, to get to the high energy, uh, which uh, would be required uh, using different drivers. So this is why, why we're doing it. Um, so what is AWAKE? Uh, AWAKE is uh, a proof of principle R&D experiment to see whether this uh, accelerating scheme can work. Uh, it's made up, it's, it's fairly big, it's more than 20 institutes and 100 people, and it's fairly recent. It all happened in the past uh, 10 years. Um, it's, it's, it's installed uh, in the CERN accelerator complex on a proton line that comes from SPS and that used to be uh, the uh, CERN neutrino to Grand Sass, so see the TNGS uh, line. Uh, and now uh, that experiment is over, uh, and so we're, uh, and so awake, uh, let's hear. What does the experiment uh, look like? Well, the, the elements that I've shown before, we have to have a laser beam, we have to have a low energy electron beam to drop the electrons in the wake fields. Um, and then of course we have to have a uh, plasma source, uh, we have a 10 meter long uh, rubidium uh, vapor uh, source, which uh, is where the plasma is formed. And uh, we have to have the, the proton uh, beam 
to drive the wake field. And then after the plasma source, we have all the diagnostics to uh, study the electrons. Um, so the sequence is what, what I was saying before. So we have the laser ionizing the vapor, forming the plasma. Then uh, the protons come in, micro bunches are formed. Uh, the micro bunches form wake fields and the wake fields can accelerate electrons. So going straight to the most important results uh, of run one, which is what, why we are uh, optimistic uh, and why these uh, studies are continuing. Uh, and this, this project uh, will continue for the next several years, is that in run one, first of all, we showed that self-modulation actually takes place um, as predicted by simulation. So in the bottom, so this plot shows actually uh, street camera images of a proton bunch without uh, the plasma on the top and with the plasma on the bottom. And you can see uh, with the naked eye, essentially, uh, looking at the picture, uh, that uh, the micro bunches uh, form. Uh, not only that, but the frequency of the micro bunches uh, follows um, uh, the expectations, uh, the expected dependency on the uh, density of the plasma. So this uh, process takes place uh, in, in a way uh, that we understand. Uh, and then of course, the second milestone, which was achieved uh, only a couple of years ago, uh, is uh, acceleration. So the, the, the money plot uh, is the, uh, on the left. You see an actual picture of the spectrometer uh, where the position in the term of the spectrometer is converted into uh, an energy. And so this is a single shot where you can see that the electrons had a much higher energy than the input energy. Um, and then we also studied this uh, in terms of, again, uh, the density of the plasma and the profile of the plasma showing that we can reach uh, energies up to 2, G, 2, 2 GeV um, from a starting energy of around 20 MeV. Um, the maximum accelerated charge uh, was uh, reasonable, uh, but in terms of uh, percentage, uh, it was actually quite small uh, because this was really a proof of principle R&D to see whether this was possible at all. Um, and, uh, and you notice I'm not talking about emittance here because we uh, didn't even try that, let's say, in the first run. And so these are the things, uh, and then uh, there's much more scientific output uh, of run one, uh, which I don't have time to show, uh, but the idea is to, uh, we have a lot of data that, um, to understand self-modulation and acceleration, uh, and uh, we have produced uh, many conference presentations, proceedings, and uh, papers, uh, some of which are linked in the uh, back, and the backup. So uh, what are our plans for the next run? Uh, the idea here is uh, to be uh, much more ambitious, so not just accelerate electrons to high energy, but also preserve beam quality uh, as well as possible, uh, and at the same time, uh, develop um, plasma technologies which can allow us to go from our current 10 meters of plasma up to 100 meters or so. Uh, and so uh, the Wake Run 2 uh, cartoon uh, looks like we have a lot of doubling, uh, mainly because we are separating the self-modulation process in the first plasma and the acceleration process in the second plasma so that we can control the two separately. Um, and then in terms of uh, milestones, uh, we want to first um, focus on the self-modulation and uh, again, have better control. So instead of self-modulating only uh, part of the proton beam as was done in run one, we want to self-modulate the whole proton beam so that there is no head of the proton beam which can cause interference. Um, then we want to make sure that the self-modulation uh, is uh, stable or that, that it stops um, um, growing at some point. Because if we don't do this, then the self-modulation process, which is uh, coming from an underlying instability, can actually destroy uh, the wake fields. Uh, for very long accelerators. So uh, this, this uh, freezing of the self-modulation is achieved through uh, a density uh, profile, uh, which we will be able to do in run two. Um, and then of course, uh, the, the, the obvious goal is acceleration uh, um, and emittance preservation and small uh, um, um, energy spread. Uh, and here are two plots. Uh, the, the left one is showing uh, the electron uh, beam following the proton beam. Uh, and in the right one, this is a, a complicated plot, but if you look at the orange, so the y-axis on the right, 
uh, and the orange line, you see that given a delicately chosen set of parameters for the incoming beam, so both transverse and charge and uh, um, profile, uh, we can get into a situation, at least simulation tells us, we can get into a situation where the emittance is preserved even after 100 meters. And so this is what we want to um, achieve. Uh, at the same time, in parallel, we have to develop scalable plasma sources because our current method, which is uh, laser ionization, uh, uh, can't, can't go for, can't, doesn't work for plasma sources much longer than 10 meters. And we want to go to 100 meters or more. Uh, and so we're uh, following uh, two different paths. One is a helicon, and one is a discharge plasma. Uh, and hopefully, uh, at least one of them will give us a technology that, uh, that can get us the plasma that we need for, uh, long, uh, for a long accelerator. So if this all works, uh, and it, you know, run one was a success, uh, if, if run two works as well as run one, uh, then we can start thinking about, okay, so what can we do uh, with uh, high energy, high charge uh, electron bunches? And can we really switch from electron R&D to particle physics experiment? Uh, and of course, one would want to go straight to, you know, uh, E plus E minus collider or, or you know, very uh, uh, fancy concepts, but uh, we want to be a bit more realistic and we want to start from things that we think uh, we can do, uh, even with the current, uh, with small uh, updates to the current setup. So the first step, uh, that we considered is producing electron bunches for fixed target experiment, because this has the least stringent requirement. And it could take place, and so we've, we've started studies uh, based on doing this at the current site, just by extending the plasma cell and seeing what can be done. Uh, and then the second step is, since we're always producing uh, these electron beams at proton machines, then we could create an electron-proton uh, collider or electron-ion uh, collider. Um, so I'm going to go through uh, quickly these two possibilities. So the first question in terms of electron bunches is what kind of electron bunches could we make uh, if, uh, you know, if run two works and we can uh, have a plasma of uh, uh, order 100 meters, then these are the charges uh, and energies we can achieve and also the number of electrons on target. Uh, and it turns out these are actually quite relevant. If you look at uh, what a wake what the reach of a wave would be in terms of a dark photon search or a strong field QED test, then you can see that uh, not only it's reaching beyond the current limits, uh, which are the gray area here um, and uh, the purple uh, on the right plot, uh, but it's actually quite competitive with many of the future planned uh, experiments. So uh, it would be quite relevant uh, to do that if we could. Um, then going, you know, a bit more ambitious, the idea of re-injecting this electron beam into the proton uh, um, uh, collider and colliding electron-proton, uh, then we have alternative schemes to uh, what we've heard about uh, this morning, the uh, electron-proton uh, uh, collider. Uh, one is a little bit uh, uh, less ambitious, uh, so uh, PEPIC would use SPS protons to drive electrons and then inject them and collide them with LHC protons. So this would get a square uh, root S of 1.3 keV. And then uh, much more ambitious, of course, uh, driving electrons with uh, LHC protons, this would give us a 3 TeV electron uh, and a root S of uh, 9 uh, TeV. Uh, and of course, and the exercise was also done uh, at the other uh, proton facility we have, uh, not at CERN, which is RIC, uh, and here again, it was shown that uh, in principle, um, the same technology could be used to make an 18 GeV uh, electron beam for uh, RIC uh, EIC. Uh, in terms of reach of these machines, uh, I'll just show um, a, a, few, uh, a few plots. Uh, this is, uh, the, uh, these are the classic deep inelastic scattering plots showing uh, what the very high energy electron proton collider could go uh, could reach with respect to Hera and of course PEPIC, which is uh, driven by, with, uh, which is a little bit less ambitious, would be somewhere uh, in between. Um, and in terms of uh, leptoquark searches, uh, here again we have uh, you know uh, leptoquarks which uh, would decay uh, back to um, electron jet or neutrino jet, uh, so it would have to be detected. Um, uh, would uh, you know, we, we, we made a simulation uh, looking at the expected backgrounds after some very simple cuts. Uh, and 
based on the number of signal events expected for different uh, uh, strengths of the coupling constant, we can see that the um, reach uh, of such a machine would be much beyond the current uh, LHC limits, which are at about uh, lambda of one, which are about here, lambda of one for a few TeV. So uh, putting this all together, uh, it's, it's wonderful that uh, Awake Run 1 proved uh, that uh, we can accelerate electrons using protons uh, and that self-modulation works. Uh, and this is very encouraging for uh, Awake Run 2, which becomes more of a technology channel uh, and engineering challenge to preserve uh, high, uh, high beam quality uh, and to develop scalable sources. Uh, and so we're optimistic uh, cautiously, that uh, we can go from uh, accelerator R&D to particle physics experiments fairly soon. Uh, and of course, we've looked at a few things, many more could be looked at. Uh, and uh, but, but, uh, of course, I hope I've convinced you that there's already uh, several interesting applications of the uh, order 50 GeV uh, electron beam, uh, which we could have uh, in a few years. Um, Thanks again, uh, and uh, please uh, ask any questions, and uh, please email me if you have uh, questions you want to ask uh, afterwards. I didn't set up a Mattermost uh, channel, sorry. Thank you very much, Giovanni. That was uh, very nice to hear about these promising results. Looking forward for the next uh, campaign. Uh, well, I would like to ask the audience, uh, if you have any question, please go ahead. Again, I don't see raised hands, so I will start, but please try to ask a question. Ah, maybe Alexander wants to ask a question. I am preparing, no. <laughs> okay, okay, so my question is the following. I come from the laser plasma community, so not so far from this. And the typical question I am asked is, uh, uh, plasma is an unstable, by definition, unstable medium. So uh, can you comment uh, on, uh, qualitatively, can you comment on plasma, how plasma instabilities could affect the quality of the, of the electron beam in terms of energy, for instance, or pointing stability? Um, yeah, no, good point. So uh, well, there's, there's two, uh, the, the, the first answer is not directly to your question, but I, I think it's still relevant is the fact that uh, plasma is unstable in terms of remaining plasma because it recombines, and so this this uh, uh, the fact that we will we are the rate the repetition rate of a future experiment uh, will be limited by how quickly the plasma recombines and whether we have to wait for this recombination before creating more plasma. Uh, this is something uh, we're studying, but I think you were asking more about uh, instabilities uh, that the plasma. Uh, causes, for example, on the pointing. Um, uh, one, one thing that comes to mind is um, uh, hosing, um, uh, the hosing instability, which is uh, something, I don't have a plot here, uh, but essentially what happens is uh, if the beam is not perfectly centered, uh, then the plasma starts moving it around uh, and yes. really doing this. Um, and so this is something we're actively studying uh, and we have uh, a lot of data in run one uh, where we have uh, looked for housing, um, especially because uh, it's, uh, it's uh, predicted by simulation, so we uh, expect it to happen. Uh, but as you know, um, the, the correspondence between simulation and, and experiment is, is hard to achieve, especially on such a, a long uh, plasma, because 10 meters are, are difficult okay. to simulate. So what I can see what uh, we have seen uh, and uh, most of this is, is, is published, uh, but what we have seen in, in a way in our experience is that uh, this instability, the housing instability is hard to get to uh, rather than, uh, so we actually have to intentionally uh, misdirect uh, the beam uh, and intentionally misalign the proton and the laser beam, for example, uh, in order to uh, get the housing instability. Um, otherwise, we, we, otherwise, we don't see it. So um, in, 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 the, in, the current, in our current experience, this is not something we are um, super worried about because it, 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 hasn't, it hasn't showed up uh, okay. as strongly at the self-modulation. And it's the, with instability, it's always a game of which instability wins. So in principle, uh, 
we have self-modulation instability, which we like, and the host because it creates the, the micro bunches and the housing instability, which we don't like. And it, it turns out uh, that the self-modulation instability is much, much stronger than the housing one. So in the regime where we have looked, uh, it's, it, it wins. Now for a hundred meters of plasma, I don't know. Yeah, 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 especially for the high energy, if you want to, look at, you want to do collision experience, this is an important uh, point, I think. I, I agree. Uh, the, uh, time for one short question, additional sh question? No? Okay, then thank you again, and um, let's move to the next uh, speaker. This is thank uh, you. Alexander Molodozhensev from Eli Beamlines. Yes. So, Alexander. Oh, yes. I will uh, share my screen. Oh. Share your screen. Yes. Share screen. Yeah. Do, you, do you see the screen? Yes. Okay. Please go ahead. Can you start? Okay. So, hello, everyone who joined this session. Uh, it's very nice to make this presentation because, in principle, uh, from my point of view, uh, we are right now at a very interesting way uh, to develop a laser wakefield accelerator. And uh, I will talk about new generation of the compact XFL uh, based on the laser wakefield acceleration and uh, uh, current development and at ALI beamline and future perspectives. And uh, okay, wait, sorry. Okay. So it's a uh, uh, content of my talk is uh, I will just uh, mention about uh, Linux based FEL current status. And after that, uh, I will concentrate on the laser wave accelerations, the current achievement and uh, limitations. And uh, I will also summarize some main challenges uh, which we need to face. Uh, if you want to use laser <clears throat> to accelerate electrons for FEL. And uh, uh, after that, I will uh, talk about the compact laser based FEL at ELI uh, Beamline and uh, like a uh, whole research program which is based on the laser development. And we have some program to go from incoherent to coherent photon radiation. And uh, finally, I will tell about the uh, next uh, plan uh, beyond like a five years scale. Uh, just <clears throat> to summarize uh, the uh, current achievement for Linux based FEL, uh, we can look at this uh, page and you can see that in principle, right now in this field, we moved from very uh, nice, <clears throat> great physics uh, to great technology. And as a result of this development uh, around the world, right now we have a few uh, Linux based FEL, and uh, I divided uh, these existing machines in two parts. It's like a soft X ray facilities, like a flash and daisy Fermi in Italy, and hard X ray, like a European X fail, uh, LCLS and SLAC, SACLA in Japan, uh, SFIS fail in uh, PSI. Uh, plus, I, I forgot to mention about the Korean uh, X fail. But uh, we can see that in principle, if you're talking about uh, soft X ray, uh, the required energy for electron beam is at just 1.5 GB. In that case, we can generate the photon wavelength from four up to uh, 100 nanometers and pulse energy will be around uh, 100, 300 uh, uh, microjoule. In the case of hard X-ray, uh, the energy should be much bigger from eight uh, to 17 GB for existing machines. And in, in that case, uh, the photon wavelengths can be even less than one nanometers. But what is a main components uh, for the existing machines? And we can see that uh, what we need, we need to have a bright electron source. We need to have a Linux accelerator uh, for Linux based machines. Uh, after that, we need to have bunch compression system because the bunch length in Linux is quite long. And after that, we need to have a letter section, a photon beam lines, experiment lines. And the total footprint for existing machines, uh, if you are using Linux uh, as a driver for electron beam, uh, is quite large. It's uh, from, 300, uh, from 300 meters up to 1.6 kilometers only Linux. Plus, uh, we need to have a quite long undulator section, which could be a few hundred meters. But at the same time, you can see that uh, XFL opens a very nice, very bright <coughs> future 
And uh, when we start using uh, XFLs is like a fourth generation of uh, photon sources, uh, brightness of the beam, photon beam uh, jumped uh, significantly. And uh, now the question is, uh, uh, what uh, could be the next uh, as a, like a future um, uh, 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 XFL, which is very required uh, from the point of view of the users. And uh, now we can just review what we have. And so we have a, a ref acceleration, and we know that uh, ref acceleration is very nice established technology. And uh, it has a very long history starting from the electrostatic acceleration after that. Uh, Vidro suggested to use a resonance accelerator and all these kind of uh, very nice physics now implemented into existing Linux machines. But uh, this machine has a quite uh, significant uh, limitation. We cannot increase the accelerating field uh, up to some limit. And the uh, next question is, uh, what can we use uh, to overcome this problem? And in principle, uh, plasma wakefield acceleration is a very nice candidate uh, to uh, uh, proceed. And uh, we have very great physics starting from the VEXA proposal. And uh, now also we have a very nice, very promising experimental results in different labs. And uh, now we are waiting when new technology will come. Uh, what we can get uh, if we are using plasma wakefield acceleration? Uh, in principle, the, uh, experimentally, it was demonstrated that uh, we can achieve uh, AGV uh, using a, a laser wakefield acceleration in a discharge cutlery. And even more, uh, we also have experimental uh, achievement, which is connected to multi staging. Uh, so it means that, in principle, uh, we can use a different, uh, a few, a few accelerating, accelerating structure to accelerate electron beam up to a few GV. Uh, you can see that in principle, uh, using the two capillaries, we can get uh, even 10 GV. That's a very interesting uh, way to go. Now, just let's review uh, uh, shortly history of the laser field acceleration. And as I said, basically the first idea came from Wexler in 1956. And after that, uh, 1979, Tajima and Dawson uh, introduced concept of the laser wakefield acceleration. And it requires a very short, intense uh, laser pulse. And uh, this pulse should be injected into the plasma with appropriate density. But at that time, uh, the laser itself had uh, some kind of limitation. And uh, all experimental data indicates uh, that, in principle, concept works, but energy is limited. Uh, to overcome this problem, um, uh, we can use uh, a chop a pulse amplification, what, which was proposed by uh, Strickland and Morrow in uh, 1985. And they obtained the Nobel Prize for this uh, proposal. And now we can develop the high power short pulse laser using this technology. And this kind of laser pulse can be a driver uh, to uh, excite a laser wake field using a single very intense uh, laser pulse. And we can go to blow up regime. And uh, uh, 2002, we have another very interesting uh, proposal from Puhov and Meyer and Wen. And they started a, a bubble regime. And it opens also the way uh, to generate high energy, quasi monoenergetic electron beam without external injection and probing. So that is a very interesting history. Now we uh, need to look at what kind of problem we could have. In principle, we know that uh, laser wave cell acceleration has some kind of limitations. First, we have a uh, laser diffraction. Uh, so it means that actually when the laser propagates uh, through the plasma, the size of the laser spot will be changed. So it means that actually we need to uh, find a solution to extend this acceleration length. Another very important limitation is dephasing. So it means that uh, this kind of problem can be solved uh, by changing the density of the plasma. And the uh, next important point is a depletion of the laser energy. And uh, in that case, we need to go to low plasma density. And another also very important uh, item which we need to think that's a, a bunch charge limitation because uh, a bunch which will be uh, uh, injected into the bubble 
it will change the properties of the accelerating fields uh, by using some uh, beam loading effect. So, but anyway, it's, uh, on this uh, also slide, we can see that in principle, uh, we have very nice experimental results and they indicate that uh, increasing of the laser power and reducing the laser plasma density, uh, we can go to very high energy. As I said, it's, uh, uh, in two, 2014, uh, the Lehman's team in uh, United States, uh, they obtained experimentally uh, four GV, and uh, now even more, they reached even eight GV. So it means that actually, in principle, uh, this way is very interesting, and uh, we know what to do. So, but uh, let's look at this problem from the other side. Uh, what kind of challenges uh, we have if you want to implement this laser-driven AFL? So, and uh, on this table, we can see that in principle, if we have a Linux-based AFL, um, uh, we need to have energy up to 17 GV. Uh, laser plasma accelerated based FCL, right now we can say 5, 8 GV is possible. Next is uh, RMS energy spread. What we need, we need to have uh, for FCL, we need to have energy spread is, which is less than one. Uh, in principle, right now also we have for laser plasma acceleration, we have uh, experimental evidence that's in principle by optimizing the acceleration process we can get. Uh, 1%. Uh, but the most important for AFL uh, uh, is a parameter which calls like a slice energy spread, which is uh, very, very small. It's, uh, for Linux based AFL, usually they have a slice energy spread less than 0 0.1. For plasma, um, uh, plasma accelerator right now, we don't have uh, this kind of data. We need to understand uh, how to manipulate the bunch uh, to reduce the slice energy spread. That's problem number one. And in principle, uh, to face this problem, uh, we need to de uh, design the dedicated electron beam transport, or also we need to have a special undulator section. Uh, bunch charge uh, looks like uh, more or less fine. It's uh, we can get using a laser plasma acceleration required bunch charge. Uh, bunch length without compression, uh, laser looks very nice because in that case, uh, naturally, we can get a very short bunch, which is determined by the uh, laser pulse. Uh, peak current looks fine. RMS uh, beam divergence uh, for laser plasma acceleration looks uh, more or less problematic. We need to find some kind of uh, advanced laser technology uh, to uh, provide the small, uh, okay, sorry, we, 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 need to, we need to reduce the divergence of the beam by using the optimal injection scheme. Repetition rate, that's a uh, very challenging. You can see that in principle, all existing machines, Linux-based machines, they have a repetition rate more than 30, up to even 27 kilohertz uh, in DESI. And we uh, achieved the uh, numbers for laser plasma accelerations are around 5%, uh, five, repetition, five years repetition rate. That's a very uh, challenging, and we need, we need to find some kind of technology uh, for the laser development. And stability and reproducibility for Linux based is a perfect. It's a, it's a very nice established technology. It works fine. For laser steel, we need to improve the parameters of the laser uh, to have a stable operation. In the case of stable operation, uh, we have some experience because, uh, in principle, uh, we are working uh, with, uh, in, in collaboration with Hamburg University. And uh, we prepared the experimental setup, which has name loops, uh, which also is based on the laser and uh, produced the incoherent photon radiation. And by using the uh, uh, capillary cell, a uh, gas cell in the capillary. And using a loop setup, uh, what we did is uh, we had a 24 operation using a five years repetition rate, and we reached a 400 MeV, and it was a very nice achievement. The similar achievement was done by uh, Flash Forward and Daisy, and uh, they had a 72 hours operation uh, using a discharge in the capillary. And uh, what we need also, we need to think about the dedicated electron beam transport development, including the electron beam diagnostic. And uh, what the most important that we need to preserve the quality of the electron beam uh, accelerated by laser field. And because in principle, we'll have a very strong uh, effect of the uh, chromatic aberration plus uh, collective effects. 
Alexander, you have two more minutes for two, ah, two, two more. Just two more. Okay. It's a, I will skip some kind of introduction about the UI beam line. Uh, and uh, what I will say that now we have a concept for the uh, laser field acceleration. And according to this concept, what we need, uh, we need to have energy only 1.2 GV. And uh, it looks like for this energy, we can reach saturation uh, after 20 meters. And uh, also right now we are pre preparing the setup, which is based on the discharge indicator. We have, uh, uh, we made the simulations to see a gas field indicator. Also we are planning to use uh, active plasma links in our setup in future. Uh, and uh, also right now uh, we are thinking about the dedicated electron beam transport because uh, we need to preserve the parameters of the electron beam accelerated by the laser. Uh, we designed uh, the dedicated uh, electron beam transport uh, for incoherent photon radiation, and now we are preparing this setup E5 in our experimental hall. And in principle, uh, we are planning to have also a demo field, and in the case of the demo field, uh, we will go to uh, water, regime, water window regime, and in par uh, if you look at the parameters, it will be very similar to the existing field in Italy. <clears throat> And on this picture, you can see the plan which we have right now up to the end of 2022. Uh, we will build this uh, setup in E5. We will have uh, two lasers, uh, L3 and L2, will come to our setup in E5 and uh, will produce incoherent photon radiation for user operation. And uh, after that, uh, we will extend our beam line uh, in, and we will optimize the parameters of the electron beam for the de demo field. And finally, we will replace compact FL, uh, compact undulator, and we will use a, a FL for undulator for FL, uh, and which could be also compact, but uh, around uh, 2.5 meters. And also, we are planning to use a CD to fill. And uh, after that, uh, if we proceed successfully this uh, demo field experiment, after that, we are, uh, we are going to build a uh, water window FEL. And all this activity right now uh, is uh, in the collaboration in the, of the Europraxia. And finally, it's uh, shortly, sorry, it's uh, uh, unfortunately no time for uh, detailed presentation, but. Uh, as a conclusion, I just want to say that the successful realization of the demo field project and FEL uh, will open the way to build uh, laser plasma based FEL using a high repetition rate laser. Okay, thanks for your attention. If you have questions, uh, I'm ready to answer. Thank you very much, Alexander, for the very comprehensive uh, talk. So I will not ask questions this time because we, we work at the same, uh, in the same project. So I would like to ask uh, the audience for questions. No more questions. No maybe, single maybe question. I should extend my talk <laughs> so, for a couple of minutes. <laughs> so that means everything everything was clear, and uh, we probably can move uh, can move to the next uh, to the okay. next. Okay, thanks, thanks. Yeah. Thank you, Alexander. Thank you. Yeah. So let me invite Francesco Schilaci from Eli Beamlines again. Uh, we'll be talking about the recently uh, installed Eli Maya ion beamline. Please, Francesco, yes. Uh, is my screen visible? Yes, I can't hear very well you. Can you try to speak? Uh, yeah, can you hear me now? Yes, so I'll try to speak loud. <clears throat> yeah, okay. Uh, so, uh, uh, thanks for the introduction, Daniele. Uh, I will be presenting basically our uh, ion beam transport uh, line installed uh, in, the, uh, in our experimental hall, which is dedicated for uh, uh, ion acceleration. So, uh, this is uh, a live beam lines building, and we are put on a particular section of the experimental building, which is two floors underground, which is the ion acceleration hall called E4. Uh, this is a summary of the equipment uh, we have. We will be focusing on the ion beam transport line today. Uh, all these equipment listed here are uh, realized uh, in order to provide the user uh, with some uh, 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 beam with defined 
parameter which is very, very well characterized in energy uh, and uh, also uh, in uh, dose from the, the uh, for the last part of the ion beam line so the user will be able to um, get a beam that is uh, um, useful uh, for uh, for example irradiation especially uh, we are focused on the medical application but we are uh, anyway the goal is to provide um, uh, the beam for a wide range of uh, users where any kind of uh, uh, experiment can be carried out. Uh, this is uh, um, the uh, how the experimental uh, uh, hall looks like at the moment. So the beam transport is installed. Uh, we have a plasma mirror chamber, then the beam goes to the interaction chamber to target the seats here, and then we have the, the ion beam transport and the dosimetric station where the beam is characterized in air and sent to the irradiation point. Um, so we are about to start the commissioning at the end of this month, hopefully. Uh, and uh, um, well, uh, to focus on the uh, ion beam transport line, which uh, here is uh, uh, like um, uh, better described, uh, it is divided in uh, uh, three sections. So we have a collection section sitting here, then a, a chicane for the energy selection, and the last uh, uh, part where the beam got in air for the characterization. Um, uh, before uh, describing the ion beam lines, we need to understand how the beam is produced uh, 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 by the laser shots. I think the I think the me uh, laser interaction mechanism is uh, uh, not important at the moment. What is important is that. Um, a laser accelerator can produce a large number of, uh, of ions, especially protons. Uh, the, bun the, the bunch is uh, uh, pretty short at the production point. Uh, and it is, um, uh, well, in literature, you will find out that the beam emittance is very low. Uh, this is actually because the uh, beam is extremely small at the source in size. Uh, the size is like comparable to the uh, laser focal part. We are talking about some uh, uh, tens uh, of micrometers, but uh, the angular spread of the beam, the angular aperture of the beam, as you can see in this plot here, is uh, pretty huge. Uh, uh, also, the beam uh, has a, a wide energy spread. Uh, from basically from zero to a certain cutoff that depends on the laser on the target. Uh, and this is a nice feature because uh, basically our beam line is intended to select a certain energy from this spectrum and deliver this energy, improving the beam, uh, the beam feature uh, to the user. Uh, so basically uh, we want to provide, uh, we start with a uh, beam that was emitted to look like that, so, but we want to provide something that is most, most, most similar uh, to a uh, classical cycle from beam and um, so, uh, our, these are the sections that uh, I will be presenting. We start with the collection section. Uh, but before um, discussing the collection section, we need to understand how uh, we want to select the beam. Um, so basically, it is important uh, to uh, first define uh, the selection method. In this uh, case, the, um, the choice is to use a single reference orbit along this uh, chicane, uh, and the orbit is fixed for all energies. So this means that we have to change magnetic field to select the different uh, energies, uh, and this is uh, uh, this is uh, this has the advantage that basically the energy resolution is fixed and depends just on the least uh, uh, aperture side that is set at the uh, in the middle of the sheet. Uh, so basically, with the standard electromagnets, we can select uh, with um, very good uh, precision um, uh, protons uh, up to uh, 300 mV and uh, carbon ions up to uh, 70 mV per nucleus. Uh, so once the reference uh, orbit of the chain is defined, um, we can uh, define how the uh, selection system has to be done. Uh, the selection system basically has to inject in the selector the uh, energy component that we want to select. So some uh, um, constraints on the um, transfer matrix of the beamline has to be uh, respected, which are basically, basically want uh, a waste on the uh, radial plane and the uh, al almost parallel beam on the transverse plane. And uh, this uh, condition has to be um, uh, fulfilled for uh, a wide range of energy. Uh, and uh, the choice uh, is uh, at the end was to come up with a set of five permanent magnet particle with a pretty high gradient over a large ball. We are talking about uh, 36 millimeter of a magnetic ball here. Uh, so the pole uh, uh, the peak field is around 1.8 Tesla. 
and uh, uh, these magnets are made by a double array of permanent magnets. Uh, the inner uh, array is a uh, higher uh, coercitivity, otherwise the magnet, the, the wall array will try to kill itself. And uh, uh, this is uh, so the, the gradient, uh, uh, the fit quality, the gradient uniformity, and then the integrated gradient uniformity are pretty uh, high. So it's uh, pretty, uh, like high uh, quality field magnet. Uh, the magnets are uh, set on a mechanical uh, um, system, allows to displace, uh, to change the relative distance about the magnets. So this is the only uh, degree of freedom we have to do optics for different energies. And also the uh, mechanics have been designed in order to withstand the huge uh, force between the magnets, because they have to be, anyway, uh, pretty close to each other. Minimum distance between each magnet is uh, uh, around uh, 15 millimeters. Um, the magnets have been characterized with standard accelerator uh, at the INF and LNS. Uh, this is a comparison be between uh, uh, simulation and uh, 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 experimental data uh, for the characterization. So we have a pretty nice control of the beam. Uh, in the uh, films here, you can see that uh, the beam is a little bit tilted, but this depends on the uh, alignment position uh, that is possible to reach uh, uh, using the optical telemetry that uh, it was done uh, during the characterization. Uh, so, uh, after the collection system, we already have a definition of the uh, chicane. The, uh, so, but before uh, designing uh, the, the selection itself, so we need uh, to understand the emittance growth in the, uh, in the uh, quadruples, because we don't want to lose uh, any more particles inside the energy, select, in, in, in energy selector. Um, so you see that these two systems are strictly linked to each other. Uh, and um, for this reason, uh, the acceptance of the chicane has to match uh, these numbers here that describes how the beam uh, looks like at, uh, when in, uh, at the output of the collection system. Uh, this means that we have to design. Uh, we have we have to design four uh, electromagnetic quadruples with a field that is going from 0 0.06 up to 1.2 tesla. Uh, effective length is uh, uh, variation is within uh, two millimeters, uh, and the, the gap is uh, pretty large because uh, of the beam inside uh, here would be uh, uh, pretty pretty large as well. Uh, the magnets are laminated. This is important. Uh, I will stress this, uh, uh, the importance of the lamination of the magnets in, in a minute. Um, so, uh, as you can see here, the reference trajectory uh, lies within the good field region of the magnets. And these are the magnets uh, uh, installed again at INF and LNS for calibration of the, of the chicane. So basically, we did uh, uh, calibration with different energy using cyclotron and tandem beam. So this is an example, um, changing field uh, and uh, basically checking if we can send the beam on the nominal uh, selection position, which is 160 millimeter uh, shifted from the reference beam axis. And uh, uh, basically, as you can see in this plot, which is comparing uh, analytic formula, simulation, and experimental data, everything lies uh, on the same uh, curve. So the calibration is pretty uh, uh, is pretty precise, and also the control of the chicane uh, is uh, uh, pretty well in my opinion. Uh, regarding the lamination, um, uh, the chicane it can be used also as an active energy modulator. In fact, uh, uh, the lamination of the yoke and the proper pruning uh, of the uh, power supply allow us to change field every uh, second within a range of plus minus 20% uh, uh, respect of the um, starting point of the field. Uh, without any eddy current aspect uh, on the vacuum chamber, so we don't have a high harmonic component of the field uh, uh, producing uh, range or a modded aspect on the beam, which is anyway polychromatic beam here. And uh, we can use the chicken method to deliver for uh, every, every shot, every data shot to different beamlets to the irradiation point, so in a way that to uh, reproduce the spread out black peak, which is uh, uh, extremely important for the radiation, also from the point of view of a medical application. 
Um, then we have uh, uh, the beam line uh, ends with uh, two quadruples and uh, two uh, correctors. These are basically standard magnets. Uh, there is no need to spend uh, more time on this, but maybe we can have a look at some beam transport simulations. So uh, just to give you an overview of what we expect to have at the output. Uh, so we start with a, a, a particle beam spectrum and a, a beam aperture that I showed you before. Uh, the, uh, we try to prepare the setup, for example, for um, 60 mV protons. So we start with a, a monochromatic beam. We set up the quadruples, so we set the energy, uh, the magnetic field inside the energy selector. And at the output of this chain, we, the, the beam uh, is uh, pretty nice, and we are losing 80%. Uh, so 20% of the beam is still preserved here. Uh, then we can refine further the beam shape. Uh, using the last part of the beam line. Uh, but still here, the beam is uh, monochromatic. In fact, when we go uh, to a realistic uh, uh, laser-driven spectrum, uh, you see here that um, uh, first, uh, first of all, uh, uh, they, uh, at the, the slit uh, uh, position, uh, the beam is not completely selected. This is why we need four dipole. Actually, for the selection, two are uh, more than enough. But we need to uh, disperse the beam twice, uh, uh, two more times, in order to have uh, the output, the energy spectrum that we are expecting. This is due to the fact that uh, the uh, large divergence is uh, somehow mixing everything inside the system. So two more uh, uh, pending stages are necessary. Uh, so the, how the beam spectrum evolves inside the beam line is here. So we start with the, the exponential uh, thin scale like spectrum. We are losing a lot of particles inside the, uh, the quadruples. Then uh, at the uh, in, at the selection point, the spectrum, as, as I told you, is still pretty large. But uh, it is clean as we want uh, at the output of the chicane. And here we are, as you can see here, basically in the chicane, uh, we are not losing any more particles in, uh, within the range that we want to select. But uh, the beam shape uh, is uh, not optimal, um, as in the monochromatic case. Uh, as in fact, you see this star shape, which is kind of memory of the quasipolar field that's imprinted in the beam. Uh, but this can be in, uh, further improved using. Uh, the last part of the beam line, the, the two quadruples we have, and uh, uh, also eventually some uh, passive uh, element on the inner parts to improve the, the beam form. Um, we didn't start the commissioning as I told you, but we are already designing a high energy and a very high resolution Thomson parabola spectrometer. These are some equations uh, that tells you how Thomson parabola uh, spectrometer works. Basically, it is a simple device, you have an electric field. Uh, for energy dispersion, dispersion and uh, uh, for uh, charge separation and the magnetic field for uh, uh, energy separation. Uh, and the issue here is that we have a Thompson spectrometer, but it cannot be set in on the main line because of the presence of the magnet. But the presence of the magnets allows us to have already a magnetic uh, dispersion sector. So the idea is to use dipole one inside, of the, inside the chicane as a, a part of the Thompson parabola spectrometer and install inside this chamber a set of electrodes for the charge separation. Uh, so yeah, uh, basically the charge, the electric uh, sector will be installed inside dipole 2. Uh, the challenge here is that uh, the gap, uh, the electric gap will be pretty large because we cannot destroy acceptance of the chicane. So we need a pretty high electric field and uh, this, is what, this is the reason why we are on the uh, prototyping phases, so we build a mock-up of the chamber. Uh, we have a procedure to install the electrodes and the insulators inside the chamber using a pneumatic sponsor. And uh, this uh, uh, mock-up will be tested from the high voltage point of view uh, next uh, week. Uh, so in case of uh, uh, not major issue, uh, we will go to uh, finalize the installation of the electric field inside the um, uh, chamber that is in, uh, in the chicane, and uh, we, will, uh, we will finish the uh, preparation of, of this uh, additional device that we are preparing. Uh, so I've got two, two more minutes. Yeah, I, I, I done. This is a, like a summary of my talk, but I think that probably the most important message is that we are about to start uh, the commissioning. So hopefully, uh, within the end of the year, we will be able to receive the first uh, 
user, uh, let's say assisted user commissioning experiment in, uh, uh, in the ion acceleration only for. Thanks for the attention. Thank you very much, Francesco. Again, I will not ask questions this time. Uh, so, time for questions. We can have uh, even two or three questions. Okay. Nobody asking questions. Okay. okay. Then thank you again. Thanks. Bye. And let's move to the to the next talk. So this is this will be given by Lori Nibi uh, from Royal Holloway University London on bridging the machine detector interface. Please. Hi, thank you. Uh, can you see my slides okay? Yes, perfect. Yeah. Okay, uh, thank you very much. Firstly, uh, thank you for, uh, for allowing me to, to present um, here. And this is given on behalf of uh, the group at Royal Holloway, um, who've contributed to, to a lot of this, and this represents a lot of our, uh, our, our work uh, together. So uh, bridging the machine detector interface um, so in the machine detector interface, uh, we typically uh, we typically consider reach or try to isolate uh, the experiment from the machine, and the machine is something to deliver uh, a beam or, or in a collider um, to a particular point, and then the experiment is situated around that. And a lot of high energy experiments are focused uh, on uh, high transverse momentum uh, uh, interactions and observing them. Um, however. Um, a lot goes in and out in both directions, uh, despite best efforts. Uh, so you, uh, incoming to a, 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 an experiment, you can have uh, products from residual gas uh, interaction, so inelastic or elastic interaction, uh, leakage uh, from, a, from the collimator system perhaps, um, and secondaries perhaps from beam loss that may uh, pass through and penetrate in, uh, the rock uh, and come into uh, a, a detector or experimental area. Uh, complementary to that, we also have uh, lightly scattered uh, primaries. So on the outgoing side, for example, uh, not every particle uh, undergoes an interaction, usually a very small proportion from uh, in, a, in a collider. And uh, so these can uh, undergo light scattering and then actually continue for quite some way, uh, but be de deviated enough that they may eventually be lost. Um, there's also uh, physics debris, so if there's an inelastic collision or there's uh, secondary particles produced, and uh, there's a potential for forward physics or forward experiments where we're purposefully looking uh, in the forward direction. Uh, so the goal here is, uh, uh, can we uh, simulate uh, far-reaching particles in and out of the experiment? So there's uh, dedicated detector models. And there's, uh, you know, dedicated accelerator models, but can we bridge that gap? And uh, what can we, what can we uh, learn from that? And here, you really need a, a combination of two different strategies. So what, um, there's a very uh, specialized uh, way of uh, simulating detectors and uh, producing uh, uh, sorry, uh, uh, Monte Carlo data from them. And there's also specialized uh, ways of simulating the motion of magnetic fields and the, the particle tracking throughout the accelerator. So how can we combine those and really bridge this interface? Um, on, the, on the topic of accelerator tracking, so um, we need to uh, understand the motion uh, through uh, many uh, thousands of uh, uh, magnetic elements, hundreds to thousands of magnetic elements. Um, and perhaps it's in a circular collider and may uh, make uh, thousands, millions of repetitions in a simulation to get the, to understand uh, the, the, the outcome that you wish to desire. So for that end, there are many uh, specialized tracking codes uh, that do a variety. They typically specialize in different, uh, different aspects. Uh, these are used to calculate the motion of particles through these fields in a very precise and, uh, and accurate way. Um, without losing precision or accruing errors. Um, and so in these tracking simulations, these are, these are quite specialized for, for the part, single particle dynamics. Uh, and a, a common, uh, common way is then to use these for beam losses and is to simply evaluate when the, the particle coordinates are greater than, a, than the mathematical definition of an aperture. Here you can see a little cut through uh, of part of the LHC and we have a definition of the 
of the aperture around the beam envelope. And so when some single particle exceeds that aperture, uh, how, uh, how it is therefore counted as lost. Of course, this doesn't, in real life, this doesn't, uh, particles don't just stop. Uh, on the other hand, uh, a 3D uh, radiation detector model is, qu is quite complex and, and really uh, highly specialized. Um, so it's, it's really bridging these. Um, how, do we, how do we do that? These uh, detector models are specific to one detector. Uh, they're uh, built up over a, and highly detailed, built up over a long time with many people. So how can we do this in such a way where we can learn what we need to, but uh, without that uh, degree of specialism? Um, so a solution that we've uh, we've gone for is uh, to actually to use accelerating in Jant4. So Jant4 is a, a widely used open C, uh, open source C++ uh, uh, library uh, for modeling detectors. So it includes a 3D ge uh, geometry description, a library of particles and particle uh, particle physics processes. And so the concept here is to add accelerator tracking to this. So benefit from Jan4, which is what, uh, regularly developed and updated based on all the latest experiments, um, and then add accelerator tracking uh, to that. Um, we can benefit a little bit if we build a Jan4 model. Uh, accelerators are typically uh, repetitive or have similar shaped components uh, for a given accelerator. Uh, so we can benefit a little bit from that. So uh, the idea is to use a library of uh, very uh, generic but uh, scalable and proportional uh, uh, magnets that we can build up a Jan4 model in a very quick amount of time, uh, but then include accelerator tracking and benefit uh, from both. There is a there is a subtlety uh, here, and that um, uh, so a, a radiation transport model will use Cartesian coordinates. Um, there is no preferred direction, and uh, it has to uh, uh, it would be in, in three dimensions. However, for accelerator tracking. We typically use a curvilinear coordinate system, so the the description of the particle motion is with respect to uh, an in, uh, a reference orbit or the axis of the machine, and so the coordinates are uh, or the change in coordinates is relative to that particular path. Now this allows us to maintain a lot of precision, um, a high, much higher degree of precision, um, but uh, we really have to merge these two if we're going to make a model. And the way we do this is actually not just to build uh, a 3D model of an accelerator, but also to build what's called a parallel, uh, a parallel uh, world geometry, which is another set of geometry in the uh, with the same uh, world or dimensions, um, but with a different uh, with different uh, volumes in it. And here we build a series of uh, cylinders that follow the beam line. Now we can use these and query any point in the 3D model, and then query it in the parallel world. And then we can get the coordinate transform into the, the, the frame of each of these cylinders, which gives us our curvilinear frame. Um, and that allows us to go between the two systems. So to use the, uh, the, the, tr the accelerator tracking, but in a Cartesian model. Um, another little subtlety is that in accelerator tracking, uh, we typically use what are called thin elements. And these are just uh, elements with no length that just give an instantaneous kick. Uh, to the beam, and these are used for to the edges of magnets to to as an integrated effect of the the fringe fields or of the magnet where the, the magnetic field is no longer uh, completely uniform, and also for uh, any imperfections. So we can use a perfect dipole for the body, but then uh, uh, insert thin elements which have higher order uh, multipoles to account for any imperfections. Uh, so here we actually can achieve the same thing in a three D model, but just putting a very very thin uh, volume in, in place that will uh, will give the same results. Um, so this is uh, this uh, solution, as it were, uh, actually was uh, thought about and started by Graham Blair in 2004 at Royal Holloway and our and our uh, and our simulation group there. And it was originally for linear collider backgrounds. Um, so it's all wrapped up in, a, in an application called Beam Delivery Simulation or BD Sim. Um, and the idea is, as I've described, to make automatic models of uh, Jan4 models of accelerators. Um, it's now uh, quite mature. It's been uh, redeveloped and uh, actively developed since around 2013, and we're uh, our group supplying it to many different machines. So for ILC or Click, uh, for for example, for muon backgrounds where you have uh, secondary production such as muons transport through the beam pipe and then interaction with matter, perhaps uh, in the yoke fields of magnets, and then back into the beam pipe and perhaps through rock, but still reaching the detector. 
Um, and uh, a week for uh, their final dipole, there was a, a, an old colleague who worked on that. Um, Expel for undulator dose, LHC collimation as, as myself, uh, and uh, also, uh, which I'll describe later, um, for uh, Atlas non-collision backgrounds uh, and phaser, uh, which is a forward search. And uh, recently, uh, one of our colleagues, uh, Will Shields, has been working uh, towards medical applications. So although start, we started with high energy applications, is to really uh, take it down to low energy, where uh, such medical beamlines uh, require the interaction with material and degraders, and also uh, beam forming and shaping. And uh, here's just a, a little bit of uh, uh, validation. So this is a, a single pass beamline with a highly varied set of optics, uh, ATF2 in Japan. There was a practice for the linear collider uh, where we validated uh, the machine and uh, the optics. And there's a publication describing the implementation here. Um, uh, one thing is that is integration and data. So, you know, it's, it's great. We have a, we have a Jan4 simulation or we have one that uh, can, can deal with accelerator uh, tracking as well. Um, but oh, how do we make use of that? What information do we take from it? How do we understand uh, what information we get? Uh, there's so much you can take from it. Um, so a few practicalities are that we have a, you know, a modern uh, build system. Um, we use, of course, Jan4, Root and CLHEP. Our data is written out to root format, uh, and this is uh, something that's you know, widely used in HEP, and uh, the structure is a pair event structure. So this allows us to filter and do selections, and a very typical HEP analysis that people would be familiar with in a detector community, um, as you can see a little uh, screenshot to the right here, um, as well as a bit of uh, trajectory storage and filtering. So you know, if I have muons at a particular plane, uh, where did they come from? Uh, oh, they came from something that impacted here, but was scattered earlier on here. And understanding these histories is uh, really, uh, the data format and the analysis is really key to this. Um, here is just a little screenshot. So we also put in yet another parallel world is uh, invisible uh, little uh, planes, uh, which re can record the distribution of particles. And we use these for uh, the, you know, validating the accelerator tracking, but also to understand uh, and record data interface planes where we might hand off to another dedicated experiment. Um, so using this, uh, we have made a complete model of the LHC. Um, so I'm only showing just a small bit here. It's actually very hard to visualize because uh, <laughs> it's, it's quite narrow with uh, such a big shape. Um, we have uh, optical validation, so we match the beam transport throughout. Uh, we have some specialized geometry, but uh, still we go to a level of uh, genericism in that. And we are validating it for, uh, for proton uh, and, uh, and, in fact, ion collimation. So here, uh, particles lightly impact a collimator. This is a, a left to right is the, is, a, is the machine in a linear sense that follows it with uh, eight eight, eight uh, straight sections and uh, eight arcs. Uh, here, this is uh, IR7, where a lot of the collimation is. And a zoom in here shows you, uh, uh, so in the top is the beam loss monitors, the radiation monitors uh, strapped to the side of the machine. Uh, our simulation of energy deposition in all of the magnets, and then a more conventional tracking simulation that includes some physics in the collimators and uh, some secondary proton tracking. And so the, really the, the top one is what we measure and then we have to go from understanding really to, to, to the measurement and, and between. Um, application of this, so one of our, one of our uh, students now postdoc, Stuart Walker, uh, has, uh, he made a much more detailed model of uh, 500, well, of about three to 500 meters leading up to Atlas in one of the interaction points. So including uh, all the geometry of the tunnel complex and you can't really see it's quite small here, but there is a beam line of all the magnets throughout, as well as uh, some of the geometry you can see here for the specialized shielding blocks. And so the purpose here was to, to simulate uh, beam losses and leakage from the collimator system and then propagate it uh, through with all the interaction of material up into an interface plane before the detector, where we could uh, then hand off to a dedicated ATLAS uh, detector simulation and then understand hits in the pixel detector coming from uh, non-collision backgrounds. Um, and on the right here, you can see a spectra of what uh, was simulated up to the interface plane. And then also in the bottom is the, the origin of, uh, for example, for muons that reach that interface plane, their angular distribution and their original creation point uh, to understand where they've come from. 
Um, using the same model, another one of our uh, uh, PhD students, so Helena Lefebvre, uh, you can actually, if you go to this link, she's got a poster today and a, one, a really quick uh, couple of slide presentation. So using the same model, but developing it further with more detail and actually using it backwards. So this time looking uh, at things going out from the IP is uh, for Phaser, which is a, a forward experiment from Atlas that would uh, be put in a small side tunnel looking uh, so looking through the wall as it were back towards uh, the atlas ip so here we're propagating uh, uh, head-on collisions through uh, the complete accelerator lattice and also surrounding material to predict the muon and neutrino flux uh, observed by the detector through through uh, through the tunnel and so i, I would uh, really recommend having a, a look at that it's quite an interesting uh, topic uh, another one that uh, another topic uh, that sort of leads on from this is physics debris. So um, obviously, as I said, people typically the detectors are designed to detect things uh, uh, with high transverse momentum. But also, it's quite interesting. There is a lot goes forward now. Uh, perhaps this is maybe not. I mean, it's not surprising and not uh, not so interesting. But there are a few interesting facts about it. Um, so uh, we would. Uh, I'd quite like to simulate this and understand it. Uh, so we can have elastically or inelastically scattered but intact protons that come from the collisions and uh, we can also have secondaries from in, uh, inelastic collisions and here's an example spectra um, and so what we find is and this uh, this example is in lhc and part of my work with the collimation group here we find that uh, at certain points around the ring there are radiation monitors which are highly correlated with luminosity um, and not the stored intensity, so not the amount of beam that's in the machine. And these, you, well, again, maybe not, not surprising, but what is surprising is these that can often be very far from the experiment, and you can actually, uh, uh, even halfway around the ring or all the way around the ring. Um, these are, these, uh, it's more of a curiosity, it's not a problem for the machine. Um, the beam loss monitor system is used as, an, as a protection mechanism to avoid any quenching of the superconducting magnets. But it was more of a, a curiosity, and also we wanted to understand it so that it wouldn't be a problem for high luminosity LHC. Um, but I want to understand this more, and uh, we have this ability to make a detector model, in effect, of the whole accelerator. So this is what I've, I've started uh, simulating. So simulating head-on proton-proton uh, collisions. I'm using uh, CRMCs and event generator with a, a civil model. And I'm propagating uh, uh, particles in both directions from IP1, uh, IP5, and IP8. Now, IP1 and 5 are the two high lumin, what are the, called the two high luminosity interaction points for Atlas and CMS, and then uh, the other one is for LHCb, which has a lower luminosity and a lower uh, crossing angle and different different magnetic optics. Um, so what you see here is a combination of all those uh, simulations. So. I'm simulating uh, head-on collisions at uh, each IP, propagating them, and then I'm doing that for different each IP and then doing a weighted combination according to the luminosity. And so what you see here, this is the energy deposition in uh, each uh, component in the model and then scaled according to the luminosity in the cross-section. So this is the power, as it were, of energy deposition we expect uh, during the running machine. Um, and what you can see is that although there's a lot situated around uh, the particular IPs, there are actually uh, losses throughout the machine, which come from the um, from these physics from the physics debris. Now you might say that well they're linear, they're sort of linearly distanced from the particular one, but uh, this is looking in the middle of the machine. Uh, you can see some are from the the closest IP, but some are also even interleaved from other IPs on the other side of the machine. So we can have things that can reach really quite far uh, and be related to particular experiments. So the idea here is, uh, can we make use of that? Um, you have uh, two more minutes. Okay, okay thanks. Um, the, this isn't, however, what you would actually see in the real machine. If you looked at the, the beam loss monitors, this is the energy deposition in the magnets in the simulation. And then outside of them would be uh, beam loss monitors. So we would, uh, to really make the proper detector model, we are, uh, we've modeled an individual uh, beam loss monitor here. This is made in a, a, a piping package also developed for uh, geometry uh, preparation and conversion. And then here's a calibration model um, where, we, where we run a, a very detailed, uh, down to very low energy model of the gas interaction to get a parameterized model, which we can use in a much more efficient way 
uh, in the in the bigger model without having such low energy uh, cuts and interactions. And so the goal here is really uh, to to place uh, uh, all of these in in the model, um, and and to understand these uh, the physics debris fully. Uh, one uh, thing that we've noticed is that for really long term tracking, so not just single turn, but maybe thousands of turns, uh, we don't uh, conserve. It's like not conserving energy, but it's really the phase space of the emittance uh, would seem to blow up. Now this is called uh, symplecticity or a lack of symplecticity. Um, and here, it's not because of the algorithms used, which are designed not to, uh, they're designed to be symplectic, but actually that uh, we just, uh, there's a convergence on the intersection with volume boundaries, and there's little gaps between all the volumes, and this really uh, builds up over time. And so our goal is really to, to eliminate this uh, with a much more integrated approach to tracking. And uh, there are several ways we could do this. Um, one is to use a tracker and then pass to the 3D model uh, when the time is right, uh, but that's a bit specific. Another one is to have uh, only a 3D model when you have uh, a region of interest, maybe a collimator or a target, and then uh, deal with a tracker in between. However, there's no there's no possibility for physics here. And so what we're working on just now is actually really integrating and overriding the tracking in JANT4 to maintain both the Cartesian and the curvilinear uh, coordinates. Uh, and a consequence of this will also be a, a vast uh, uh, performance increase, which is necessary when we have to run millions of events uh, for the required precision. So um, just to conclude, it's a, a bit of an introduction um, on how we might go about this. So it's how to bridge the machine detector interface, how to simulate these uh, two things by creating uh, such a model and uh, accelerator tracking and tracking all particles uh, in an accelerator. Uh, so hopefully I've uh, I've illuminated a little bit about how you would go about that, um, and just uh, just as conclusions, we have a full model of the whole LHC in Jan four, um, and we're understanding uh, the physics debris from that, and in the future will be fully symplectic. And uh, yeah, if you have any questions or uh, anyone, uh, yeah, thank you very much. Thank you very much for the very interesting and colorful. <laughs> so the session is open for questions. I may start with one. Uh, you mentioned the AWAKE uh, experiment. We had a present nice presentation today. Uh, oh, yes. In terms of a plasma wake field uh, acceleration, typically we use a particle in cell code. So is there any intention to build another bridge? Actually two bridges, but it should be one to the Monte Carlo simulation, one to the accelerator part. Did you think about this? Uh, yes, so um, for, for a week specifically, what we did is uh, it, was, it was actually not used for the plasma, in, the plasma interaction, but it was used for the calibration of the dipole and the understanding of the, of the screen at the end. Um, yeah. But uh, yes, so I, I guess I, I, perhaps uh, the plasma interaction is really quite a complicated one. Uh, and hard, hard difficult uh, to bridge with. However, uh, one uh, a sort of similar concept is collective effects in accelerators. So this is where uh, you know particles interact with each other. We've seen yes. for high intensity beam lines, you know, collective effects, space charge are really important to actually get the losses correct. And just now we're doing single particle dynamics where each particle is assumed to be independent. Uh, which works well for the things we do. So yes, there's actually work just now on how we can uh, bridge a, a collective effects, how we can do that actually, and whether we do it after each element or we do it uh, as we step along throughout the thing and to make use of existing libraries, because again, it's, it's quite complicated uh, to simulate. But yes, I think that's, that's something we're looking at. And we'd actually started looking at it for medical applications at low energy, where it's also very important. Um, and uh, for electron uh, beam transport as well. So it's a, uh, we don't have, uh, there's not something immediately just now, but it is something we're working on. Uh, okay, very good. So good luck. So it will be very interesting to see some results in the next Thank you. conference in two yeah. years, in person, hopefully. Yes, hopefully. <laughs> Thanks. Uh, any more question? Mm -hmm. Audience? Okay, today everybody, every, everybody, was very clear, so no more question. Thank okay. you again, Lori. So Thank next you. talk and last talk will be given by how how you she on uh, on studies of the beam background at CEPC is from IHEP from uh, Chinese Academy of Science. Please.
Hello, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, I'm going to sharing. And can you see my slide now? Yes, perfect. Please go ahead. Okay, great. Okay, thank you for introduction and good afternoon. Uh, I'm speaking on behalf of, of the CEPC MDI Beam, beam background study group. And today I'm glad to have a chance to sharing with you the latest study status of CEPC MDI beam backgrounds. My talk contains three parts. Oh, sorry. My talk contains three parts, the motivation and some of the study details and the outlook. But to begin with, I'd like to give you a short introduction of the CEPC project itself. As you may know, CEPC stands for Circular Electron and Positron Collider. It is a designing future lepton collider. The CEPC conceptual design report was published in November 2018, that is two years ago, and some, some key CDR parameters and the conceptual figure of the project were shown here. And for now, CEPC is a 100 kilometer double ring design with a crossing angle of 33 milli radians. To achieve the physics goal of CEPC, we will need an excellent, ex excellent accelerator and detector in good performance. And to push the performance best, we will need better to take the focus, which may impact the performance as much as possible into consideration, even, even in this early design phase. Among other factors, the background is one of the most critical issues. It may impact the detector in several ways and have to be well studied. Our study flow of the backgrounds contains three aspects, design, simulation, and benchmark. The loop of the study flow means that we must keep evolving together with the whole project itself. The flow starts from, and we'll go back to the design, the first step. We must take one particular design as a baseline of our study. Now we take the original CDR design of both CEPC accelerator and detector as a baseline. Here shows the layout of the downstream parts of the CEPC interaction region. For the first step, we will focus on Higgs mode and take only one IP and one beam into consideration because they should be symmetric. And since it's still a preliminary study, we only study the background impacts on vertex detector, which will be the closest detector to the IP. And most parts of our study were based on the two step, uh, step two simulation. Before we actually perform the simulation, we must have a general idea of the sources of the other background. For CEPC, we will have three effects, three kind of effects, the single beam background, luminosity related backgrounds and injection background. But the last one injection background is very hard to simulate. So it, I will plan to think about it, it in the further study not now. And from the particle type of the primary, they are mainly photons and of energy beam particles, that is electrons or positrons. The, simula the simulation workflow contains three steps also, generation, tracking, and detector simulation. We use several ge generators to generate spectra for selected backgrounds. For some of them, we're using the well-known existing generators and for the other, we will use our own formula-based generators. We do have some cross-check of this too. Then we put the spectra into the tracking tool to record the loss distribution within the interaction region. Finally, we will use the interaction region loss distribution as a source to perform the full detector simulation. And to quantify the impact on detectors, we will use heat density, GID, and NEO, and adopt it the Atlas way to estimate. Our first step is the basic simulation to have an idea of how worse the background will be. We will take several backgrounds using their own generators to get the spectra. And for checking tool, we are now using SAD and BD SIM. And for detector simulation, we are now using a tool called MOCA based on Gen4. For photon backgrounds, we only studied synchronous radiation and beam strong or I could say pair production. 
the synchrotron radiation, which may impact the inter interaction region components, were mainly generated when the beam passing the last bending magnet of the final focusing. So we use beta sim to transport the beam particle from the last dipole and then use Gen4 as the generator of it. Here it shows the spectrum and also the impacts of the synchrotron radiation. Pair production means the photon backgrounds from beam strata. We use GenPIC++ as a generator and implementing the detector solenoid and other magnetic field by code updating ourselves. Here shows the TID and NEO spectra of the pair production. And the other important source is of energy beam particle, contains beam gas, beam stralon, beam thermal photon, beam stralon, and radiative, radiative bagba. We choose these four among all the of energy beam backgrounds because of our short lifetime, several hours or even several minutes. Shorter lifetime means more last, including in the inter interaction region and hair impact on the detectors. Let's dive into them one by one. Beam Stralon was generated as an IP, and for the spectrum plotted by, by our own generator, we can see a very narrow peak. And the tracking here confirms that most of the last happens after two after second turns. And compared with beam stralon, the spectrum of the radiative bulb plotted by BB Bram is much wider. The scattering also occurs at the IP, but the lost lots, lots of them would be immediately get lost. That's a red peak on the downstream part here, told us. Beam thermal photon and beam gas brim are different stories. They were not only generated at the IP, but also everywhere in the whole ring. The spectrum of the beam thermal photon plotted by our own generator shows the relatively wider one compared to beam stralon. So it may have some immediately lost here as a right line and also some multi-turn loss as well. And for now, we only generated the scattering within the interaction region and also the 200 meters upstream of the IP. And the spectrum of the beam gas brimstralon plotted by our own generator two also sh shows a wider spectrum down to the zero and up to the energy ex ex acceptance, which is 1.5% in the design for now. And for beam gas, we assume that the residual gas is carbon oxide and the pressure is 10 to the minus seven Pascal. But different than others, beam gas Bramstralon also has some zero turn lasts with the green line shows here, means that this particle is lost immediately after scattering, even before the recent IP. So combine this four and normalize to the Y axis to the loss rating megahertz per 10 centimeter, we can find that Bramstralon contributes the most, as this line shows here, and the total loss was also high. The contribution from the up stream last may be slightly higher than the downstream last, which is very bad news. So we must do something to mitigate. For our aspect, mitigate also means optimization. And for design, we put some masks and collimators. And for simulation, we are trying to be more accurate. So we are trying to simulate the scattering in the whole ring for beam gas, gram stralon, and the beam thermal photon, not only 200 meters. For photon backgrounds, we have synchronous radiation and pair production. So we, for synchronous radiation, we put three masks designed here on the upstream part of the interaction region to shield the SR. And it turns that works. The heat density and also TID were several orders lower. But however, the pair production was very difficult to shield. So we just skipped to the off energy backgrounds. Now we are used two sets of horizontal collimators located around 2000 meters away from the IP to shield the off energy beam particles. And we, for now, we assume that they were ideal ones because they were only checked in the tracking tool. It do not contain the interaction between the collimators and the particles, and then study their effects. We are trying to add more, but uh, it's still under study. And the collimators works also at least on simulation. We can see from the comparison for both four effects that almost all the upstream loss here, here, and here were almost gone. 
except for the last one beam gas frame shallow, because I mean, they were some more here were generated as, as their return up and get lost before they reach the IP and after the collimator. So we combine this results again, and in this time, we do not need to worry about beam shallow. We also perform the detector simulation using the lost in the interact region as a source. And so we apply a safety factor of 10 and less impacts in the first layer of vertex detector. We can see from the chart that it may still higher than the tolerance of the vertex detector now we are designing. And among all the backgrounds, the beam gas Bramstrong contributes the most. Therefore, we have to think about further mitigation. We also list all the steady status of the simulation here. We may need to optimize what we have done and are short to thinking about with what we haven't yet. And the last aspect of the study flow is benchmark. It is important to validate the model as well as the code, both based on literature results and experiments. And for experiments, we are considered to study on um, BPC2 or best rate. The basic principle of this study is to distinguish a single beam one and luminosity related one. Then the data or Monte Carlo comparison could become possible. And we have did a two hour experiment last summer by changing some machine parameters, but actually the results were not well. The results from experiments and the, the simulations did not match or even the fitting itself is still struggling. So we plan to do it again with well preparation and maybe a longer time. And it's time to summarize from the simple checklist here, we can learn the goal and the status of our study. And in the future, we are sure to optimize our study both on design, simulation and benchmark. And we may take some new baseline and put our machine mode like Z and W and other detectors beyond the vertex detector into consideration. And uh, that's all of my talk today. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much for the very clear talk. So we have a lot of time for questions. Anybody? Yes. Massimo Caccia, please. Hello, hello. This is Massimo Caccia from Università di Insubra and INSM Milano. I have a question. If I if I got it right, you, when you sum up the contribution, you get to something of the order of eleven hits per centimeter square per beam crossing at the innermost layer for the vertex detector. Now, this is telling me the average. But do you have any indication about the azimuthal distribution of the hits? They are all equally sprayed over two pi that I guess not, or they have anisotropies. Uh, if I make your question clear, maybe not. For now, we uh, we only study the electron and electromagic showers. Can I get your question right? Yes, can you maybe go to the summary slide where you have the different contribution at the innermost layer of the vertex detector? You, you, mean, you mean this chart? I mean, I mean here, yes. So yeah. if I look back heat density per centimeter square per beam crossing, and I got up to 12, let's say, which is fine. But these 12s are, are actually distributed evenly, uniformly over pi or over phi, or you have a concentration in specific regions of phi? Uh, this is, oh, we took the, the highest number, not, yes, not, not integrated over phi or, or, or any, we sure. just took the highest not number and I'm then, but, but since you generated the heat, you're supposed to yeah. know whether in azimuth, in phi, they are evenly distributed or not. Uh, they are not evenly distributed. Yes, this is what I was guessing. And, yeah. and, and the, they are, the, the density is higher on the horizontal plane? Yeah. OK. OK. Any 
Any more question? Okay, if not, let's thank the speaker again. And I would like to thank all the speakers for the very high quality presentation today. This is the uh, last block of uh, session 11, Accelerator, but uh, I would like to remind you that there will be a poster session today at uh, 1.30 p.m. Uh, Central European time. So please, uh, if you are interested, you can, uh, you can uh, take part in the poster session. And uh, yeah, thank again and uh, enjoy the rest of the conference. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye.